Good afternoon everybody, welcome to another sunset safari, for the moment at least, from Juma Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands in South Africa. And we've started off the drive with our beautiful young male stinbok that we see very regularly here on quarantine, fiddling around down there in amongst the grass and that lovely yellow flannel weed that just gives some beautiful context to what we're looking at. But lots of things happening on quarantine, as always. We've got Indialas, we've got Impalas, but always a treat to see those little steenbokies. But my name is Ben. On camera, I have Rian with me and Gert as well. And uh, yeah, we're not really sure what we're going to do this afternoon. Obviously, we'll be following up on the Talamartes and S8. I think Tristan's already looking for tracks for them because they moved off. Oh, a little steenbok galloping away. Uh, they moved off uh, east. They were seen on the dam wall, I think, around about half past nine, ten o'clock-ish. And I know Tristan had some buffalo up by Bottlethook Dam, so we were debating that perhaps, because it was quite a strong wind this morning, with all the rain, maybe there was the scent of buffalo drifting across the savannah. So maybe they've moved up northeast, but I'm sure we'll get some tracks if they weren't all washed away. But in the meantime, yeah, our little steenbok has decided to have a little bit of a rest in the grass. Of course, he's they do eat a little bit of everything, Steenbok, but particularly in the drier areas where they are very prevalent, they're well known for digging up tubers and bulbs and things, and because of that are very water-independent antelope, often associated with drier areas. And you can see the impalas in the background, and there was an Anyala bull somewhere. I think he's hiding behind the tree now. We are, I was hoping to find you a nice little creche of youngsters, but I think they're all sort of in the middle, in between the roads, and we can't see them properly. But I counted about a group of about 15 or 20 of them uh, yesterday up in this area. And after the cubs frolicking around this morning, I thought it would be nice to show some frolicking baby impalas, but it seems that we are just got adults for now. Still very beautiful. You can see, just like the steenbok, you can see that white stomach that they've got, all designed to reflect heat, radiating heat from the, uh, from the ground. Joey, we are also ready, and yes, Sunday fun day. It wasn't a fun morning this morning with all the rain that we've had, but touch wood, fingers crossed, uh, the rain does seem to have cleared for now, and the sky is certainly a lot brighter, but that was quite the downpour this morning. We, when we drove back, uh, before we just sort of finished up uh, in FC this morning, uh, we were driving through rivers. The roads had become rivers already, and there has been some flooding in Kruger and north of us towards Palabora. It was a bit of a torrential downpour. We got a little bit of localised heavy rain, but thankfully not for too long. But important for the bush, I saw I commented this morning how low Gary Dam looks, considering we've had some rain. So that little uh, deluge this morning would have been gratefully received, and of course most water holes are in natural depressions, that's why they form in the first place, so all of that groundwater, uh, because it was such heavy rain, it wouldn't have really have had much time to seep into the soil, it would have all flooded down to those low-lying areas, and the dams will be gratefully, uh, or grateful for that extra input of water. But speaking of rain and, uh, and weather in general, let's send you over to the weatherman and see what is in store for all of our different locations this afternoon. And don't forget, of course, we would love to hear from you. If you've got any questions, comments, uh, anything else you'd like to discuss with us, please do send in anything and everything, and we'd be delighted to answer them. Hello and welcome to the Kariche Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa. My name is Ralph Kirsten and we've had a lot of rain coming down here over the last day and a half or so, but it's cleared up a little bit now. There is still some rain around, but hopefully we don't get wet this afternoon. Anyway, this beautiful little young foal has been uh, running around full of life bursting with energy it's uh, it's just stopped now but I'm hoping that we get to see 
how he was running around. He was absolutely enjoying himself. And it's lovely to see that it stopped being wobbly and it is happy and healthy. I don't think that's the mom on the left there. Mom's just off on the right. So I'm just going to wait and see if he does his little mad run around again. Awesome. I haven't seen any of the baby bless book um, right now since I've been back but I'm gonna look around for them and I'm sure there might be even some new additions as every time I'm coming down now it seems like there's new fresh little babies and this one I think is just going to the toilet probably everything now is new for this one learning as it goes including bodily functions Normally, you know, like my basset hounds, they have a poo dance. After they go to the toilet, then they run around very happily. So let's see if this baby zebra does the same. It's not as happy as my bassets normally are. There's mom over there. They grow up so fast. It's incredible. It's a lovely setting right now. It's uh, rather cool. There is a warm breeze. A couple of birds calling. You can hear a southern boo boo and a black cuckoo. As mommy just gives a little bit of affection to the little one. So Jamie, not particularly in the actual raising of the foal. The foal will stay very close to its mum and the stallion will maintain the harem as per usual. So it's um it's all about the defense of, of the group as a whole and the stallion maintains that. Kind of like what lions do, the male lions, for the pride. It's similar with zebra and it's uh, uncanny actually how many uh, similarities you have with the so social structure of between zebra and lions and obviously with them being immortal enemies um, with lions really liking the taste of zebra uh, but they are very similar in that um, where the male he sort of chases off other males, provides the security um, and he does that job, leads the group but he's not actively involved in the raising of the foals per se. That's left to mom and you'll see these little ones they'll just stay very close to mom's side with the odd bursts of energy and running off but then they do come back pretty quickly and it's also because of that supply of food and milk and as we go along we might even see that uh, you will find the little babies uh, feeding on their mom's dung initially they're just going to be drinking milk um, and then they will feed on a bit of that dung that does assist with their digestion um, but it's also nicely broken up food already so um, that's how they sort of start uh, feeding on solids and there it goes for a drink But for now, it's just going to be purely milk. See there, as the droppings come out, might be having a look and even a, a feed already. Nice to see that. We often talk about it, but you don't often get to witness it. And it does indeed look like it's feeding on it. So that's also coprophagia. Feeding, uh, feeding on dung or feces or scat. Very, very interesting. So, and it's lovely that I get to sit and spend time and watching the developments from the first day that it was born and now we're a couple, day and a half or so later and we'll see how it develops as we go day by day. It's got a lovely sort of 
brown fluffy coat coming out of the black stripes. That's how you also see the youngsters. And they keep that for about a year and a half. Between a year, year and a half. Then they start to lose that fluffiness, but they'll be a lot bigger than the, this little one is now. See how it's also on, looks like it's on stilts. Very long legs. So, the coprophagic little baby zebra. Wonderful. Well, as always, I'm not going anywhere. This is my secret spot next to the Scotia Dam and listening to the lovely birds while I watch this little baby zebra. And while I'm serenaded by birds, it sounds like Ben is as well. Oh, welcome back everybody. We've got a beautiful red-billed hornbill. Look, look. He's been very vocal this afternoon. Just see the one actually looks like a youngster from what I can see, or maybe a sort of a juvenile or a sub-adult. Normally they're called in a duet, and you'll see them, they sort of actually, he's sort of half raised, hunching his shoulders when he, when he calls. Like, <laughs> Uh, often they'll put their wings right back over their heads and bow forwards and they normally do that in a pair so I'm guessing that this could be a young male who's maybe sort of uh, showing off a little bit, maybe trying to attract his first female. And obviously being on the termite mound here is obviously a nice little staging post but there's probably lots of little termites that are out and about after the rain maybe doing some running repairs to their mound. Um, so also potentially feeding they do enjoy a termite, that's for sure, the hornbills. Of course, they have that nice relationship with the dwarf mongoose that often stay in termite mounds as well, where they'll forage together and uh, benefit from each other's alarm calls and things. More eyes. But you can see them feeding on something in the grass there. It's a very good chance that there are some insects out after the rain we've had this morning. Often so the, the rain does bring the insects, and that brings along all of their predators as well. But he was sitting so beautifully there next to the road, and sort of half-heartedly displaying, so I think it's perhaps a young one who hasn't quite learned the full technique yet. He's got this sort of black stripe down the back of the head, I've never really noticed that before, that's another reason that I think that's potentially a juvenile. The coloration just looks not quite a hundred percent. Of course we do get the yellow build here as well, which as the name suggests the bill is yellow, but this one also has a much smaller bill in general as well. The, the, the heaviness of the bill uh, is a lot lighter in red-billed hornbills. And it's a slightly smaller bird and there is a difference um, in the calls as well. And this one has that sort of secondary note, uh, almost says go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back whereas the yellow bill is just more of a tuk 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 without that second note. Mm, having just checked here, it seems that black stripe is normal. I've just never noticed it. Maybe it's because of the rain. Everything's got a little bit more contrast, a little bit duller. Perhaps the, the blacks and the whites are standing out a little bit more. But we learn something every day. Speaking of which, today we've decided to give you guys um, a bit of a, a on-running quiz this afternoon. So between myself and Tristan, once an hour, we will be posing you guys a question and we would love to hear your answers. So I will give you the question in a minute uh, and you can send through your answers along with your name and email address when you do answer. And there will be a prize for those of you who get the question right, who are chosen, uh, or one person will be chosen. And I believe the prize will be one of these lovely t-shirts that we have been uh, modeling over the last few days with the animal rights range that we've sort of got on at the moment. So the first question is there is crab spiders are one of the sort of unspoken about and forgotten about predators here often found uh, in the felt out here and often take a lot of insects and other arthropods and some species have a very unique way of <laughs> Uh, how shall I put it, staying unseen. So we'd like to know if you, if you know which, what we were referring to there. So how do crab spiders remain unseen on the hunt? If you think the, that you know the answer, 
then please do send through your answers along with your name and email address. And uh, sometime before the end of the hour or at the beginning of next hour, we will give you the answer and let you know who has won. So do send in your suggestions. Please, we love hearing from you. Or if you have any other questions about what you're seeing or about crab spiders or anything like that, send them in. I've got a bit of a spider thing going on at the moment, um, doing a lot of reading on spiders. I don't like spiders. I don't want them on me, but I think they are one of the most fascinating things out here. And I'm sure this hornbill wouldn't say no to a spider if he's probably eaten a few already today. But you can see he's thoroughly enjoying life after the rain. Can we stop there, please? Because... <laughs> Now we have got some leopards making love. Now this is not like when a baby human bites your finger. Let's push play on this episode of The Wild Show. Welcome to an overcast and cool Madikwe game reserve on this Sunday afternoon. We've hoped, hoped that everybody had a very relaxed day. We're looking at a few elephant bulls here in the thickets. Just see the top of his back. Afternoon everybody, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kevin, behind the camera, the wizard, BK. We've got, uh, we had two bulls on the road here, one being that one, and his sparring partner, other side of the road, which we can't see now, and they were having a little bit of a tussle. And we're hoping that they're gonna do it again. He's gonna walk out into the road for you in a second. Yes, afternoon, big boy. When these bulls play fight, it's almost as if they're taunting each other. They will break it off, and the one will go in its own direction, and then the one will walk over again, almost taunt, and then it starts again. And that's what we're hoping for while well, we're looking at a big ear above the thicket. You can clearly see that ear slit.
And our other friend is standing with his bum just off the road. There. Darren, how are they to you? Like Darren, all animals that haven't got fur, that hasn't got hair, tend to love mud wallowing. And we're looking at elephants, they are one of them. War dogs, for example, rhino. And Darren, here in Madikwe, the soil is predominantly that reddish color. The reason the soil is that reddish color, it contains a lot of iron oxides. And the soil is actually oxidizing, is rusting, for lack of a better word. And we've got these beautiful red soils in Madikwe. So when they do this mud wallowing and mud bathing, they take on the color of the soil. And that's that being the, your only reason. This guy does look very relaxed. You can just see him feeding. And his friend is at the back there. He's coming over again, so hopefully that play fighting starts up again. That's what I meant by the taunting. They split up a bit and then they come together and it kicks off again. Well, maybe we're lucky. It's great to see elephants feeding here in their natural habitat, in the thickets here. You can see that massive hump there behind the head, on the neck. Those muscles to hold up that massive big, big head. You can imagine the weight of that. And that's what that hump is, is that shoulder muscles, neck muscles. Uh, And guinea fowls, what are you so upset about? On our left here, can you hear the guinea fowls alarm calling? We're going to check out what is disturbing these guinea fowl. In the meantime, let's go and join Chris there in Pridelands. Good afternoon, everybody. And it's a bit of a bittersweet moment yet again for me. Because this is the one creature that I needed yesterday to put myself into a winning position and I came to Leopard Dam twice and didn't find it here. Anyway, that's all done and dusted. I give it a good go. But welcome, welcome and yet another lovely day out here at Pridelands. So what our plan is today, we're gonna pretty much just drink it it's been quite a lot of rain this morning, obviously, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to work the burnt area. The grass has flushed uh, quite a bit of green in response to the rain. And I'm hoping that there would be, obviously, some herbivores moving in there and the associated predators. In the meantime, look at my nemesis here. <laughs> if I can put it that way. The grey heron, such a common bird. Yet yesterday it 
was not as common. Right, so what we're going to do now, I'll start off with Red Earth from there, Olduvai, and then northwards around the burnt area and then obviously execute our plan. Probably should introduce myself. My name is Chris and with me on CamOps is Panda yet again. And let's get started. Let's get started. Let's do that. Go and see if we can't find cats again. I feel like cats. Now we'll just look at this grey heron. It's a bird that occurs widespread throughout most parts of Africa. And even into parts of Europe, Asia, and beyond. And they even occur as far as the Indonesian islands and even as far as the extreme parts of Russia we talk in Siberia and so forth. And interesting is in South Africa or Southern Africa they are a resident bird but north of the equator in Africa they actually migrate. So there's a migrating population that moves from sort of central, central North Africa to other parts of the Mediterranean parts of Africa and even parts of Southern Europe. Although the population in Southern or at least South Africa are basically what we refer to as a resident. So they stay here. You might have local movement. They might move from this dam to another dam within the greater Kruger. Yeah, you get that. Those long legs. The Grey Heron. Yeah, quite a bit of wind and I even touch on the weather. We're looking good at the moment, so overcast, some heavy stuff towards the mountain, but I think that will stay there. Above us, high lying, high lying clouds. So I think for now we're actually good. Nice and cool. Touch windy though, but I think this is generally speaking relatively good conditions and you can see towards the mountains it looks ominous but we are all good good afternoon everybody and welcome to a beautiful Okokoyo we are currently with some beautiful giraffes my name is Lisa and I'm your waterhole naturalist of course monitoring the different water holes and uh, checking what we might be able to share with you we just had a beautiful herd of elephants but literally as soon as they came <laughs> they left as Murphy would want it but I am very happy to report we had our first baby oryx in Ukukuyo today so at least from what we know of course you know, there might be others around as well, but this morning on Escape to Nature we saw our very first baby Oryx. So very, very excited about that. 
and of course excited about the giraffes how cool is this <laughs> i love when they do that quick jump up just beautiful and as you can see it's a very nice day here in Okukoyo. Mashatu has literally been pouring the whole day Juma as well, not pouring necessarily, but drizzling every now and again. But we have had a beautiful nonde day nonetheless. And we have had quite a few beautiful sightings of the red built quilias coming and going for water. So it is just an absolute stunning Sunday here in Okokoyo. Vicky, thank you so much for your comments and for getting in touch with us. We always love hearing from you. And yes, they, <laughs> they really are the royalties of balancing. And it's always so fascinating, you know, such a massive animal going into such an awkward position. I always compare them to my father because my father is well into his 60s. <laughs> And he loves playing bowls, but he's already had two knee replacements. So sometimes he struggles a little bit to pick up the balls. And then I always say, he reminds me of a giraffe when he does go down like that. He doesn't jump back up like that, though, I have to say that. <laughs> but yes, they truly are so, so incredible. These beautiful, majestic, large animals. And of course, you know, as soon as they go down for water, they have to be extra vigilant, extra cautious. And it's not like something like a lion that you'll see drinking water for a good two, three, sometimes ten minutes straight. They'll drink a little bit, jump back up, drink a little bit until it suffices as enough. But they truly are majestic animals and it's so incredible, you know, how they don't slip, how they don't fall. I know if I was to do that. I would uh, definitely face plant into this water hole here. Yeah? But luckily I'm not a giraffe. But of course I will keep monitoring our beautiful water holes. The Kokoyo, Mashata as well as the Juma Dam can. And while I do so, I'm going to send you to Mr. Kevin in Madikwe who is looking at some bookies. Arguably the most majestic antelope out here, certainly my favorite antelope, the great kudu. And we've got a few young bulls here. The one on the right hand side already got a fairly decent pair of horns starting. He's about, I would say, four years old. The one here in front of you, about three years old. Guys, and we are hoping they are going to walk into the open again. Otherwise, let me quickly reposition you for a better view. I think they're walking into the thicket there. BK, let's quickly see if we can pick up on them. Love to show you some more of them, my favorite, favorite antelope. The grey ghosts of the bush. And we should see them up ahead here. Where are you guys? There they go. Yes, keep on coming. Keep on coming. Yeah, this is quite a young animal, about two and a half years there, there, there about. Just love the way they pose. What are you seeing? Those big ears. Kudus love dense habitat, dense vegetation. He's actually coming towards us. That is quite nice. Hence those big ears. So sound doesn't travel in thick bush as well. And then they've got
got these four. Therefore, they've got this big antenna satellite dish. So I wouldn't say antenna satellite dish. Big, big ears to pick up sound in the dense bush. Hello, welcome back. Thank you for your question. Yes, at 11 years old, we love it that you're watching. Hello, no, um, it's only the male kudus, the kudu bulls, that have horns, the females without horns. And Ella, the reason being that because they love that, here's the younger one coming here as well. Ella, because they love dense vegetation, they rely on stealth. They rely on camouflage as their main line of defense. And therefore, the kudu cows doesn't need the horns. They rely on hiding away in the thick bush for, the, for their defense. Now you'll ask then why have the males got horns? Well, Ella. Let's look at that one in the background. Um, well, why, as the male could have got horns? Well, it is primarily to show off their size. So when two could have bulls meet, for instance, they immediately sum each other up by the size of their horns because they don't really want to fight. Fighting is the last option because they can get injured. So when two Bulls meet each other out in the bush, they'll sit, size the other up. It's like two guys walking into, into a room and the one looking at the other, and you've got the, the thin, scrawny guy and the big guy that, that goes to the gym with the big arms. So you immediately go, mm, I'm not going to mess with that guy. And that is exactly the purpose of the horns. They sum each other up. The smaller animal will go, uh -uh, I, I am not going to... I'm not going to get involved in this. And so what they will do is then break off any potential engagement. It's only when kudu bulls are very equally matched that you'll fight. In the meantime, we're going to sit with them and we're going to go to Ralph. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, well, I must say, I'm now getting confused as to which are the newest of the little falls because it seems now here in this particular harem there's two. But this one closest to us that's drinking from its mom, I think, could have been the latest addition because it does actually seem quite wobbly. So I think the one on the left is a couple of days old and the one on the right is very new and that's wonderful to see the one on the left is having a scratch on its ear I really worked that out oh, awesome 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 now like I was saying a lot of the zebras were looking like they were gonna burst well burst they did and they burst with Lots of new life. Fabulous. It's just incredible how quickly they get moving and running with mom. They'll continuously have to drink, getting lots and lots of protein with the milk that they drink. Silky, um, not that I'm aware of, um, do they sort of um, nurse other females' foals? It's generally just their own, but um, you know, it's one of those things where it probably has happened, not in my experience, however, and it's probably something that's not very common, but I'm sure it does occur. 
and not too far from here just on a game reserve actually right next door to us is a lovely story of um, elephants that uh, came from another reserve when they moved them in and there was a very young pregnant female that had a baby she was only about 12 or 13 and she had a baby and she wasn't able to nurse properly and the baby was getting very weak and it carried on like this for a few days and the matriarch actually started to lactate and she then nursed this little baby and remained with the with the young mom and the baby for a couple of months and then eventually the little baby moved back to its mom and nursed from her but it was an incredible story of how the matriarch actually assisted and sort of it seemed like taught the young mother how to nurse etc and um, then eventually when she was able to she took the baby back so it does happen with elephants as witnessed by me but I've never seen that happen with zebras you just got to watch them more maybe we'll see it happen so that one there I think is the newest the newest of the new At least it's not too hot. The updated Wild Earth app is here, as well as 12 hours of fresh live content a day for free. You can watch repeats and highlights of shows you have missed. And if you have subscribed to Be An Explorer, exclusive access to the Behind The Scenes channel. Access to rehearsals for new locations, a chance to give us feedback. And explorers also watch totally ad-free. Download the app today. Well, so many interesting things have happened since you were last with me. We found what looked to be dog tracks on shortcut Gallagher, sort of going up and down in both directions. 
So I'm now trying to find evidence of which way they went, uh, whether they were going north or whether they were coming south, still to be confirmed. I've checked Aubrey's and haven't seen anything crossing, so I'm now just crawling along the teller access to see if we can see any evidence of them crossing in this direction. Otherwise, they may have gone east, or they're sleeping in the block somewhere. We did see, actually, a little impala lamb on its own, which was a bit of a shame. Oh, look, there's Jacobin's cuckoo. Are you feeling good, Rion? You reckon you can get the Jacobin's cuckoo over there? It's just at the back of that cluster leaf. There, it's on the awkward side, but it's not every day you get a Jacobin's cuckoo sitting nicely even if he is behind the trees. Um, so whilst we're just trying to find the bird there, uh, yeah, so I'm hoping we might be able to find some dogs, or at least some evidence of dogs. He's just gone behind the branch, but where's he gone now? Uh, up a bit, Rian? Yeah, I'll go straight in there somewhere. There he is. There, you can just see that crest on the back of his head and you can see the white throat. Oh. Oh, short but sweet. Classic bird stuff. That was a Jacobin's cuckoo, which of course is one of our brood parasites. We get the Jacobin's cuckoo and we also get the striped cuckoo, look, which look very similar. You might have seen that little crest on the back of the head of the Jacobin. Uh, the striped has a longer crest than that and the striped, as the name suggests, has a stripy chest, whereas the Jacobin has a plain white chest. Although occasionally, and I have seen one or two melanistic forms of Jacobin's cuckoo as well, so almost completely black. Yeah, that, sorry, just turn that radio down. Um, of course, being a brood parasite, they're one of those birds that lay their eggs in other birds' nests, uh, and they're mostly known for parasitizing uh, the dark cat bulbuls, which are quite a common bird in this area. I'm sure they also parasitize some other birds, uh, but that was the, sort of their most famous one. Because you get brood parasites, some are really species specific, for example, the African cuckoo that we get here. Uh, only parasitizes the fork-tailed drongo. Uh, sorry, Sidley, I heard there was an answer from Mike, but I didn't quite catch the answer itself. Could you repeat it again for me, please? Ah, Mike, you say, I, th I think, if I understand correctly, you're saying they disguise themselves as ants. Um, good guess, but not true. But there is something called an ant-mimicking spider. Uh, not one of the crab spiders, but there are spiders that do sort of pretend to be ants, and they will actually walk on their six legs, and they use their seventh and eighth legs, being an arachnid, uh, and pretend they're sort of antennae, and they bounce around uh, in front of them as if they were like, like an ant would do. Uh, which is a very clever technique, but that's not what crab spiders are known for. Uh, but a very good guess, uh, and do keep your suggestions coming in. I haven't seen an ant mimicking spider for a very long time. Actually, last time I found one, you know those galls that we often show you on the silver cluster leaf that are formed by wasps? I actually broke one of those open once just to see what was inside it, a bit like a Christmas cracker. Um, and I, there were a bunch of ants in there, or so I thought, and then they started releasing silk and dropping down to the ground. So inadvertently I disturbed an ant mimicking spider's um, nest or sort of little overnight sleeping spot. But that's the beauty of nature. There's no such thing as empty real estate. And those little sort of capsules, those ghouls that are formed, once the, the wasp larvae, which was in there, has moved on, they leave this nice little hollow opening, which is prime real estate for anything and everything else to utilize. Okay, I'm turning back on to shortcut Galago because this is where we had the tracks of the dog, so I'm going to look again more carefully and see if we can get a location. And if they went this way, I've checked Aubrey's, which is over there, and there doesn't seem to be any sign of them coming out. So either they've gone east or they're in this block. Uh, but you never know with dogs, uh, if that was done at sort of 11, 12 o'clock when the rain had subsided a bit, I mean, they could be in Mala Mala by now, uh, but always worth checking up, certainly. Also did see what looked to be some leopard tracks back on VSL Access, uh, male leopard tracks coming towards quarantine, which are also after the rain, and I know Tristan did have some leopard tracks in this area this morning, but I think he said they went north. 
into Buffles Hook. So it might also be worth following up on a little bit later. Lisa Kay, you are suggesting that crab spiders hide in a hole in the ground. Uh, again, good guess, there are spiders that do that. We have trapdoor spiders, we have baboon spiders, there are things called burrowing wolf spiders. They all make use of holes and crevices. And then of course we get one called the buck spore spider as well, which is quite well known because it looks like kind of like the track of an antelope, but it's actually a spider hiding in, in a hole with a sort of a lid on the top of it. Um, but not for crab spiders. But very good guess, you guys are all getting close. You're all choosing hunting techniques that spiders are known for, but not the crab spider in particular. But I'm very impressed with your spider hunting knowledge. Those poor little uh, trapdoor spiders are one of the favorite foods of the solifuges, those red Romans or sun spiders that we sometimes talk about, those horrible orange hairy things that f fly around the ground at breakneck speed and make all of us scream like uh, girls and jump on seats. Okay, I've just got back to these dog tracks. So I'm going to have a good look here and see if we can figure out which direction they've got. This is where we found the dog tracks uh, on the way. Anyway, so uh, sun spiders, they love those little trapdoor spiders and sometimes they'll kill the trapdoor spider and take over the little hole. So you never know what you're going to find. You might find ant mimicking spiders at an old ghoul wasp nest. You might find a solifuge living in a trapdoor spider's retreat. All sorts of possibilities. Okay, in the meantime, I think we're going to send, uh, show you one of our clips on the, on the Hunt series, so have a look at this. She spotted that Tommy. The one behind us. Okay, I'm going to move the car right now. Just watch the monitor for me. There she goes. She's coming right towards us. She's right on that male Thompson's gazelle's tail. Oh no, he's gonna get away. Oh dearie me, my poor girl. That was so close. Wow. She wants to sneak away without drawing too much attention to herself. Look at that. So I don't think she saw the hyena during the chase. I think she's just seeing the hyena now and she's trying to slink away because of course any hyena near her while she's on the hunt. Look at her. See how she's trying to keep low below the grass. Oh, she's up a little bit again. But everyone's on to her at the moment. Yes, it's always interesting when there is a third party at play, when there's a hunt underway. And I've, se I've seen many of these. A um, couple of examples is, you know, elephants very often get involved when lions are on the hunt. And, you know, you know they, and it almost makes them mad. Well, for me, I've seen many mad elephants when lions are busy hunting. So very, very interesting indeed. I've also seen when jackals are hunting and lions are getting involved there. Obviously hyenas, lions, there's always that, that interaction, but it's always sensational when there's uh, something on the go and then you always see the interest from some of the other predators or from elephants who detest when there's hunting going on. So sitting here next to the Scotia Dam, I can actually now, after the rains, I can hear some frogs calling. And I'm pretty sure it's bronze cacos. It's a very fluid, like bubbling sound. It's not bubbling casinas, but I'm pretty sure it's bronze cacos. Just watching out over the plains here with the impala grazing quite... Oh, these two might have a go at each other. Let's have a look. Bit of aloe grooming. So are you going to be friends or are you going to fight? Looks 
like they're gonna be friends. They thought about locking horns and then decided against it. So still no baby impala yet. Not that I've spotted. But there are lots of pregnant females. So it seems the zebras were first. There was one foal. Now there's a few. And now that the the other zebra foals have dropped, there's the blessed book that have kicked off. And they seem to have now synchronized. So I haven't seen any blessed book now, but I'm sure when we do see them, there's going to be lots more babies. So when is it going to be the turn of the impala? I'm sure not too long. We're going to have a plane full of little babies. It's going to be awesome. With there being lots of new babies, the, the jackals have been around as well. So Wendy, yeah, when they when the males sort of form their bachelor herds, they they do they don't necessarily fight all the time. So um, outside of the rutting season, they they're pretty happy with each other. Um, but there's always a little bit of dominance between them a little bit and obviously it just increases once they head towards the rutting season and you have the, the, the shortening of the days increase in testosterone and suddenly good friends become enemies and it's crazy how they walk around like this best mates and just suddenly it's like a switch is turned and they start fighting with each other Welcome back to Ukukuyo. We are still just <laughs> serving some giraffe. There's one that is just here at the water hole and then the ones that are that were here earlier on has gone to the tree line to of course forage on some leaves. And again, just as Murphy would want it, just as we left our journey of giraffe. There were about five or six elephants that were also at the water hole, but of course they also took off. <laughs> so it's always so fascinating, specifically here at Okokoyo, to see how the animals really do just come and go as they please. But this giraffe is very, very intrigued by, I believe, the people <laughs> here in Okokoyo. Of course, this is a beautiful campsite as well in Namibia. So even though a lot of the animals are very used to the people and the noise and everything, specifically from what I've seen the giraffes, they do still find it very fascinating when they see some less spotted homo sapiens. Just to the right of this beauty, you can actually see a heron in the water. Black-headed heron. But very well camouflaged between the rocks. So it's actually in the water, but just amongst the rocks. Rocks. Hello. <laughs> Bit of a tongue twister there. We truly have seen some incredible things here in Okokoyo. I'm just very anxiously awaiting to see if we will also see some blacksmith lapping babies here, like we have in Juma. Well, everybody, 
having found those tracks, we managed to find the dogs. So we went back to the first tracks that we had and tried. I was trying to figure out if they went north or south and then had some tracks that went off into the block. So I went west into the block and we found the dogs lying up probably about 100 metres in. I uh, haven't been able to get a particularly good view of who this is yet, uh, but it looks like we've got at least four adults and I think uh, a couple of the pups. So I think it's probably the same ones we had on quarantine. Um, was it last last weekend I had them when they were chasing zebras around? So I think these are the ones that don't have uh, a, an official name, uh, but very, very cool to find dogs. It's very good for us that they obviously moved through here just after the rain and left some fairly obvious tracks for us to follow. But of course, as I said, they could have been anywhere. Uh, we were rather fortunate to find them quite close to the road, but what a great way to start the afternoon. So we did find a, as I was saying before, before we got a bit distracted, a solitary impala lamb a little bit further up the road and we were wondering why. We'd already seen the tracks by then and we wondered whether something had happened. I don't see any evidence um, of a carcass here, but I haven't been able, the dogs have been sleeping, so I haven't been able to have a look at their bellies to see if they are nice and full. Otherwise, there's a good chance there's plenty of impala tracks around here and it looks like some of them were running, so I imagine they were probably chasing them around. It's just possible that if they didn't catch one, then perhaps um, that youngster's been separated in the chaos. And that is actually one of the sort of ecological roles of wild dogs. They help to distribute genetic diversity within impalas. They chase herds and they chase them for such long periods of time and so vehemently that... Um, they often do, members do get separated and that causes them to find a different group of impala um, and that helps just to spread out those genetics. But very, very cool. You never know what you're going to find. Lions this morning, dogs this afternoon. It's not been a bad day despite the conditions. These massive ears that they've got. <laughs> Huge radar dishes. Uh, Karen, that's a good question, and to be honest, I don't know the official latest figures. Um, they're certainly very much critically endangered, as I'm sure most of you know, and population estimates are around about 5,000 or so in the world. Um, I haven't actually seen over the last couple of years where the estimations of the population size are increasing. As far as I know, they are. Uh, thanks to some good work of sort of conservation and a lot of research that's done on them. And of course, the opinion of wild dogs has changed very much. They used to be considered vermin and uh, cons they, they were considered very unpleasant just because of the manner in which they hunted and sort of ran things into the ground and pretty much tore them apart. I mean, it is quite brutal if you've ever watched uh, a dog hunt. Um, but I haven't heard if the numbers are rising, but I would like to think that they are because there's a lot of um, help for them at the moment. Um, we've got obviously research teams throughout the the continent that look after dogs, and I myself, if I've managed, I've seen dogs in Botswana, I've seen dogs in Tanzania, I've seen dogs in South Africa. So I've been very fortunate over the years, but I can't honestly tell you that they're increasing. But my gut feel is that they are increasing. I haven't heard anything particularly negative about population numbers over the last few years. So their biggest problems, though, are, well, people, obviously, and the spread of urbanisation. Uh, because they do roam over such large areas, they're not really territorial. They have a, uh, a, a big home range uh, that can be, in some cases, thousands of square kilometres that one pack will roam. And their other biggest problem is uh, that inter-specific inter competition with the other predators. Their dogs are much smaller than lions and leopards and hyenas. <laughs> uh, they can hold their own against hyenas certainly and they do harass them but they're not going to argue with the pride of lions and unfortunately mortality amongst pups is incredibly high um, and a lot of that to do is with lions and other predator interactions because they are surprisingly good parents they're alpha male and female and all the other ones acting as helpers they look after the young they bring food back for the young they regurgitate food for the young 
They're, it's a very, very strong, close-knit and well-managed family unit. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, when we've put fences around things in order to try and protect them from people, uh, but inadvertently what we've done there is uh, mean that the dogs and other predators now are much all in, in closer contact with each other. Uh, which is such a shame because they are magnificent creatures. They're so beautiful. Each one unique with those incredible markings, those fawns, those blacks, the whites. A couple of individuals there. One, two, three, four. There's at least five adults here. And I've seen at least one of the pup's heads just pop up. They're lying slightly off to the left, but in very long grass. I can just see the occasional tail swish and one head popped up. I can't tell you exactly how many pups are here, but there's at least one, probably at least two. You can see there's quite a few insects in the air after the rain. You see those ears and tails constantly twitching. So dogs do smell pretty bad. The wind is in our favour at the moment. I can't smell them even though we're only about 20 metres away from them, but they have a very, very potent scent uh, which attracts flies, certainly. You've got seven adults. So at least seven adults, uh, Khaled reckons, from the back. He's slightly higher up than I am. Looking at something maybe off to the right? Maybe not. But a real honour to see these animals, for sure. As I said, I, I think I said it about the, the ground hornbills the other day as well, but if you think even if the numbers are have gone up from 5,000 to 6,000, that's in the world. I mean, that's such a tiny proportion if you think how many humans there are and what the populations are of towns and villages and things. Uh, for there to be only five or 6,000 of this entire species covering the expanse of the globe, it's quite terrifying to think that there are so few and we really must have more conservation initiatives to ensure their survival. Of course, some may argue that it's natural selection, but remember that humans change the planet far faster than nature can keep up. And that's the biggest problem. Nature is incredibly adaptable. As, they, as they, to quote Jurassic Park, life finds a way. But when humans are changing things at such an accelerated rate, it doesn't give life a chance to adapt. It also sounds like we've had a winning answer for our crab spider quiz. So congratulations to Buddha Khan. Crab spiders, and it's not all of them, I should say, because the Tomosidae or Tomosidae family of which crab spiders are a member is very large. There's more than 2,000 species recorded in South Africa alone. Uh, but some of them are well known to actually change colour to mimic the colour of the flower that they are on. So they are ambush predators, and crab spiders will sit on a flower and wait for bees or flies or other pollinators of that flower to approach them. Um, and they'll just sit very still and when the, the insect alights on the flower, um, then they will grab them and they've got uh, neurotoxic venom which will paralyze and kill and then liquefy the internal contents and they will suck the interior dry. Uh, butterflies, moths, I've seen one with a, or a few of them I've seen catch bees before. So, yeah, ability to camouflage themselves, basically, and change colour, a little bit like a chameleon. They have the ability to alter the cells on the surface of their skin and their sort of a reflective layer underneath reflects back that colour to mimic the flowers. It's quite a slow process, apparently, to change colour. takes a few days. They kind of have to figure it out. I'm not quite sure of the mechanism, whether it is exactly the same as chameleons, which have things called chromatophores and they expand and contract certain cells and that changes the wavelength of visible light that is sort of reflected 
off the skin and creates different colours. So whether it's exactly the same, I'm not sure, but I think a lot more research has been done on chameleons than it has on crab spiders. So very well done, Burakan, and thank you everybody else for your suggestions. You are a winner. And we will have another quiz for you coming up, I, have, I am sure. In the meantime, if anybody does recognise these dogs, um, by all means do let me know, because I think that the pack that I saw last week was only five individuals, and if we're ca we've counted at least seven by the sound of it, and there's at least one or two pups. But it seems I'm not the only one who's managed to track down a predator this afternoon, so let's quickly send you across to Tristan, because he's got something he wants to show you. Well, it's been quite an afternoon so far. We've tracked the dam all the way basically to Torture Depot Pools cut line. We had to walk through many a block to find them and found them deep inside of one. It was actually such a cool track. We could, as we were walking, you could see where the lions were stepping in the buffalo dung from this morning and leaving paw prints in the block to find them. And I managed to kind of get find them and I managed to kind of get quite close to them before they even. Uh, um, or when I found them and they didn't even notice I was there. Not one of the cubs or anybody picked me up. Um, I was showing him Paul where we actually found them um, or where I was when I saw them. Find things and they don't notice that you're there. Anyway, my name is Tristan. On camera I've got him Paul. Um, it's a very tardy start for us. Um, unfortunately, Rooster's been Rooster and doing what Rooster does, which is, you know, having issues um, so it took us a while so I'm glad that we actually have um, signal where we are we're right like I say deep in a block and so I was a bit worried that we weren't going to find them um, and also as we were tracking them we're so close to the cut line with Buffalo's hook and torture it I thought maybe just but yeah we managed to eventually get to where we needed to be so that was good I always enjoy a good tracking session especially one like that where you kind of following tracks with sort of a slight twist and difference to them um, you know, normally you're looking for grass bending or um, game path that they might follow and obviously these guys walk during the rain so in places the tracks were almost invisible so the buffalo dung really helped and um, these nice little big sort of cow patties left in the bushes soft and mushy and so when a lion steps on it it creates this beautiful track that you can see in the buffalo dung um, or you just get like little toes on the edges of it um, and it makes it much 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 easier so it's very cool that we managed to eventually um, get them so I'm glad I don't think we'll have them for long once they stand up if they stand up and decide to walk unfortunately it's going to be quite a quick sighting because of how close we are to the cut line and the buffalo have gone into Buffalo's hook so um, if they decide that they want to start trailing them again we're not gonna be with them for very long on long unfortunately and it looks like they're slowly starting to wake up and get going now of course we've just had one winner for our quiz of today but we have multiple quizzes today where you can also win um, so quiz number two for this afternoon's proceedings um, is going to be about a bird which is obviously slightly different to what we had about a spider and the question is what unusual hunting tactic do black herons use um, and so you can send through um, your answer with your name and email address and like I said there will be a little prize for those that get it right. It does look like these lions are starting to wake up, doesn't it? What I'm hoping is because we're, these guys, they're on the old trail of the buffalo. So these buffalo crossed in from Torchwood to Buffalsook Dam while it was tanking with rain. And then from Buffalsook Dam, they went north. So what I'm hoping is during the course of them going on the trail, that it takes them to Buffalo Dam first so they bend back into Juma and then only out if they do that then we will have them for a lot longer because um, we are not exactly close to Buffalo Dam and we're not that far but we're not close either so it'll keep them busy for a while but if they decide to go straight onto the cheetah cut line and north we won't have them for very long at all unfortunately um, so we'll just have to see how it goes and uh, whether or not we uh, we have a long sighting or a short one but either way nice that the lines have stuck around so much and i must admit for those of you that were watching um the ama about dark main last night it is a pretty crazy thing we um 
in the morning I was talking at the breakfast table saying, you know, it would be amazing to see if S8 starts roaring during that um, AMA tribute. And sure enough, as we were finishing and saying our goodbyes, S8 started to roar from quarantine. And it was quite a sort of interesting moment because it's almost like the passing of the guard. Um, you know, Dark Man departing and S8 stamping his, his name on an area where we had heard Dark Man so many times around the dam and quarantine. Um, and I it was just the timing of it was, was quite, quite insane. You know, what are the chances that in the last 10 seconds of our tribute to Dark Man, um, S8 or in Bali Mail, I don't even know what he's called these days. Um, everyone refers to him differently. Um, was roaring off of quarantine and it's just, like I say, quite poignant to have that moment. For now though, S8 is not doing very much at all. I'm hoping this afternoon that we might get lucky in terms of um, him roaring. Uh, I don't know if he will. If they're trailing Buffalo, he might stay quiet. Um, if they're on the hunt, but if it's just to get going and start the afternoon, you might see him roar and make quite a big noise. Um, they often do do that as they get going, um, but the thing is, is if they do roar, it's going to motivate those buffalo to to get a hurry on and start moving a little bit further afield uh, than potentially where they've laid down for the day. All right, so you can see the one female's up. Let's see if she kind of gets the rest going. It's a little cuddle puddle of cubs and female. Um, so we'll just sit with them, see where they head, and see what they get up to. Dark mane. Aside from the dark mane that gave him his name, he can be recognized by a distinctive limp. This limp stems from an injury to his right leg he sustained while taking down a buffalo with the Inkohuma pride. let you know when I've got your audio. Sorry everybody about that, I'm just updating people about the location of the dogs. As you can imagine, people are quite excited to come and have a look. Uh, they don't, however, look to be very excited about anything. They are very chilled here. Still, 
with the exception of one that stood up briefly. I can't re it doesn't really look as if they've had a substantial meal, uh, but they seem to be quite happy slumbering the afternoon away here. Uh, but if, you would expect them to be quite full if they had eaten something, but if they've been slumbering here for, you know, for four or five hours, which is possible depending on when they did come through this area, I think it was quite soon after the rain had finished, so I reckon probably like sort of 11 o'clock perhaps, um, just looking at the tracks. Because remember with dogs, if they keep moving after they've fed, that's one of the adaptations that they have in order to take food back to the den site. If there are sick or wounded adults that couldn't make it on the hunt or young pups back there, they will go back and, as I said, regurgitate that food. So as long as they keep moving, their metabolism kicks over and actually stops the digestive process from beginning as soon as they lie down and become static like this those stomach acids will start their work and the chances of regurgitation are far less so if they've been lying up here for four or five hours it's possible that if they didn't kill something massive um, then they could already be well into that digestive process but we won't know but we don't see any evidence of blood on any of their faces or any of their fur which is often a telltale sign that they've fed um, nor do I see any hyenas in the area, and I would have thought if there was a carcass there would have been evidence of them. So maybe they're just passing through and having a rest, who knows. But for now we've just sort of got ears flicking in the grass, really. So I thought I'd quickly show you those crab spiders that we were talking about. I also need to correct myself, I said there are about 2,000 species in South Africa, I meant to say there are 2,000 species in the world. Uh, in South Africa, there's about 150 or so species that have been recognised, but I'm sure there are plenty more that just haven't been uh, officially logged. But these are, these are the crab spiders, and a specific genus of the crab spiders, the Tomisus or Tomisus from the Tomisidae family. And these are the ones that we often see on um, flowers. You can see they've got these quite big, sort of chunky, flattened abdomens, but their eyes always have this nice sort of triangular shape. So that's one of the ways I would always try and identify a crab spider and you can see the way that the legs come off from the abdomen there it always is rather crab like they're quite flattened and quite wide and they do look a little bit like crabs but some of these and many of these species are well known to change color certainly and yeah from what i understand it's similar to that of the chameleon that it's the changing of chromatophores and uh, pigments that are in the skin to match their surroundings now of course a bit like chameleons there's some debate as to is it actually a hunting strategy this changing of colour, or it's probably more likely to be a defensive mechanism, because if you're going to hang out on a flower and try and hunt stuff, if you're a different colour from the flower, you're also, also going to stand out uh, a bit like a, the proverbial, proverbial sore thumb to your predators. So whether it's to help them hunt or not, I'm not sure. I did read a paper this afternoon just to double-check that, and they seem to think that statistically ones that match the colour of the plant don't actually do any better than ones that don't so maybe it is more for a defensive technique but either way very cool to think that a little spider is also able to change color like a chameleon here so we can see one of the youngsters there by the look of it there's at least one more in the grass as you see it looked like he might have quite a full belly there i didn't quite see properly but at least two young ones here so again, if anyone can help me with the ID of this pack, please do let me know, because we've got three or four packs that sometimes can turn up in this area, but a bit tricky from, from where we are now. I'm still not 100% sure exactly how many adults and pups that we've got here. That's yeah, a lovely aroma in the air, which is a nice change from looking at dogs, because they normally do smell pretty bad. But we're sitting in a patch of wild sage, um, which has given the whole area a nice sort of herbal fragrance instead of the rather... The best way to describe a wild dog smell is a sort of an acrid, wet dog smell, to be honest. OK, we're going to see if we can get any activity here. And in the meantime, let's send you back over to Tristan and the lions. While the dogs are sleeping, the lions are slowly starting to stir. They've gently getting up and kind of walking and then lying down and up and walking and lying down. So that would be far, far, but for lions, I suppose it's the start of them getting going. I suspect that they're starting to get quite hungry. You know, we know that they didn't eat last night or yesterday morning. Um, and it's quite a few miles to feed as cubs.
them start to grow and so soon we're going to end up in a situation where they're, they're going to be very hungry and it's nothing like a bit of buffalo in terms of a, a herd to motivate lions to move around and cute little faces though aren't they and see the yawning and see how white the teeth are still very much um, in the infancy of their lives um, it's always a part of um, aging lions is their teeth how yellow they've gotten and the length of them and these little cubs obviously the jaws are still developing but the teeth are still shiny 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 and white um, that will obviously change as they get older if you see if the females yawn their teeth are far more yellowed um, now I'm just trying to remember I think it's these two lionesses that are next to me so there's this one on my on the right and then there's another one which I think the pole might be in the way I'm not sure if it is a pole if it is I'm sorry um, that lioness there I think these are the two daughters for the Salati coalition um, which is a group of males um, that came down from the south look this lioness has spotted something I don't know what's behind us but she's definitely spotted something I don't know if maybe there's a Nyala or Kudu moving through the blocks because this is an area where we get a lot of Nyala and Kudu and so whatever it is she certainly picked up on it and you can see how she went from just resting eyes closed to immediately focusing on whatever it is and it just goes to show I mean we've been talking about on the hunt the whole weekend this is how it goes with with cats is that they are very very opportunistic when they sit and um, rest it doesn't mean that there's not opportunities to hunt um, things can move around and walk around all the time and, and like I say maybe there's a nyala or a kudu and a kudu would be a great deal for for, for a pride of this size um, I mean it, it would get finished pretty quickly but it would be a decent meal for everybody here um, something like impalas or diker or something like that not so much and maybe that's what it was maybe it was a diker running through the bush and just the movement caught her attention I'm not 100% sure but she definitely was interested in something um, for a lioness to stand up like that and look is when they've seen something um, or heard something and they want to just check it out but I don't hear any buffalo or anything like that that would indicate um, that they heard something along those lines and anyway if they had heard buffalo they would hear it long before we do now talking about buffalo and lions and complete opportunistic hunting um, once many moons ago I was in the Masai Mara and we had the most insane hunt with the sausage tree pride and a big brave buffalo bull that tried to push them off Buffalo has managed to get itself into this little water point where it's able to use that as a defense. We know that the lions don't particularly like water and so you can see the lions are all sitting around the buffalo now hoping that the buffalo will try and break from the water. Now it's just a patience game. Basically the lions are going to try and sit here for as long as possible. Now you can see the lions have got this buffalo very close to a water point and the buffalo is using the water for safety. There we go. You see how it runs back in to try and keep the lions at bay. And you can see the lions, they don't like the water. They're not trying to go in, they're trying to look at them. You can see the buffalo is wounded. Look at that. The lions, that's where they would have both kind of got on. Now the buffalo is going to try and run. Look, the lions are coming quickly. They know this is the opportunity when it goes away from water and they want it to go from water. Here we go. They back onto it again. There we go. Look at that. They're onto the back of it. Now this is where the whole thing is going to happen. Now you'll find that the buffalo is going to be quite slippery after being in the mud and in the water. But look what the lions are going to try and do. They're going to try and get into a situation where they're going to try and keep it from the water itself. But it's going to go straight back in with the lions in tow. And look at how the lions stop and the buffalo goes in. That splashing, this is just insane. There we go. It's going to try and make a break. See how the lions are doing a little game of each one is trying to kind of, kind of tire this buffalo out as much as possible. You see, look, there's the male. Look how covered in mud he is now. But this wallow is not going to put off a lion, I can tell you that much. Well, still ranks as probably one of the most insane hunts that I've seen. Um, it was incredible to watch and it was amazing to watch the chess game and so I'll tell you the backstory about that hunt 
Um, we was at a time when we weren't live out of the Masai Mara, so we were out every day trying to film certain um, animals out there. So we had a, a cheetah family that we were following, the North Clan of Hyenas, the Sausage Tree Pride, um, a wiener pride. So there was a few different things that we got out when Kind of when I went up there, I would just take over from whichever naturalist had been following us. Nice. So I was quite lucky okay. I got to spend time with all of the families rather than just the one. Are you okay with them? But we had gone out and at that stage, the Mara was flooding completely. It was, a, I mean, it was more rain than you could imagine and it was really difficult to negotiate the Mara and we were struggling a little bit. So we went out to actually film a kind of behind the scenes thing of rain in the Mara and we had all our, our covers down because it was tanking with rain and I was busy filming um, this thing and I was kind of sitting on the dashboard and there was no sign of anything we were just parked in the middle of nowhere no one had seen anything and um, I'm busy filming this stuff and we kind of recording and out of the corner of my eye I just see a lioness coming right past my foot around the front of the car because I was sitting on the sort of left side of the car opposite the steering wheel and my one leg was dangling outside of the the car because it was just more comfortable and this lioness came past um, and then the next thing I see from behind the car I just see a buffalo bull running um, and so it was complete chaos I tried to jump back into the car to start while the cameraman's tried to get all the flaps of the rain roof up and I lost my shoe in the process it fell out the car so we just left it and we drove and we ended up following these lions and they chased this buffalo and the buffalo actually got away the lions, it was just, you know, the, the way that they had hunted, because it was just such an opportunistic thing, I think, um, they just completely botched it. Um, and this buffalo ran off, and they, it ran straight into a little dip where the happy zebra clan of hyenas was denning. And the happy zebra clan hunt buffalo. So as soon as they saw this buffalo coming, they ran after the buffalo and started to try bite its testicles and the buffalo stopped and started fighting with the hyenas and it was about 200 meters from where the lions had stopped chasing and the lions then saw this and they ran in chased the hyenas off and then the battle of this this buffalo and, and lions ensued where they were on top of the buffalo the buffalo ran into the mud there was one lioness that tried to get in with the buffalo another young male got dragged in and he was covered from head to toe in mud and eventually the buffalo kind of tried to make a break for it and Kapuli, the big male lion, um, he managed to get on top and then the pride all came and between all of them, um, Kinky Tail and Kapuli and when the rest, the they managed to weigh his buffalo down and eventually bring it down and it was the most insane the thing because it was a stormy the sky, um, this open plain and just absolute chaos and I remember Scott Dyson and I, Scott was a, a naturalist with Wild Earth, we were in the, he, I called him to come and see it because you know it's not every day that you see lions hunting buffalo and it was such an epic standoff. Um, and it took in total for that hunt to take place um, and that particular event it was about two hours and 35 minutes I think was the total time of that hunt um, so it was a back and forth and it was just constant raging between these buffalo and lions and the one lioness got thrown uh, it was crazy 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 I actually have some really cool photographs from that sighting that I've never really posted anyway not that I've been on social media at all for the last year um, but I must get those out somewhere. It was a, it was one of the most epic scenes that I've seen. And like I say, just that landscape with the Olololo escarpment in the background and this storm raging. And um, there was also a Kenyan um, Parks Board official that was in the sighting. And they were so excited by the fact that this, these lions were taking a buffalo because they had never seen it, this particular guy. And he was holding his rifle and he got so excited, he by mistake to try and see dropped the rifle outside of the car next to where the lions were hunting and killing this buffalo and it was trying to get the rifle back. Oh, careful boy, don't stand on a thorn. Um, and eventually we managed to get it all sorted out. And I remember then Scott and I sat there well into the night. I think we left that sighting. I mean, that probably happened at about five o'clock in the afternoon. And we then left that sighting probably at about one o'clock in the morning. Um, we had our dinner just sitting there watching the lions and a, and a cheeky jackal try and eat. Now, interestingly enough, just moving away from that sighting, which was pretty epic, um, you see S8 is sniffing this female. I wonder if she's not starting to show signs of an estrus. Um, he's, yesterday was doing the same thing. It's the same female that he was standing over the whole time. And you can see how he's actually starting to salivate a little bit. There's um, moisture coming out of his mouth and he's a little bit of a Fleming grimace. Look, he'll sniff there. And let's see, he might phlegm and grimace when he puts his head back up. I'll try and get that scent into that organ of Jacobson. There we go. To try and analyze whether or not she is indeed in heat. 
How cool is this though? And he is right next to us. I wonder if he might give us a little roar. Now she actually urinated right there, so it's probably why he's sniffing so much, because that will be where the scent is strongest. So cool. <laughs> and now he's going to do a little scent mark, so he's going to rub. Like I say, it's possible that he might vocalize. I just sprayed that bush. I'll just try to see whether or not. Jamie Lee, say well done, Tristan and team. The lines are great. Well, thank you. I, like I say, it was actually a, such a cool track. I, I was saying it a few days ago that I really wanted to track um, like a nice proper one where you go through and um, let me just roll back for you a bit, simple, so you don't have those branches in the way. There we go. Yep. Um, and I was saying like lions are always quite nice to do it and so we started on the tracks at Gauri Dam and we followed the tracks in fact important if you can come back to me while this other car approaches just because I'm sure the lions are gonna wake up a little bit here we go sorry excuse the being a little bit dirty I can't believe it's actually dusty given all the rain we had this morning and trying to get home all right so here is it says Juma Dam but that's actually Gauri Dam it's an incorrect name for this particular waterhole Juma Dam is actually on Cheetah Plains but anyway they crossed here this is where Ben had them this morning so they crossed across the dam wall they came down like this they went briefly onto Gauri Cutline and then they turned back onto Central all the way along Central up Nyala Road then they turned back cut across the drainage line back onto Central walked east across Drakensberg Road then here on this bend is where they um caught the scent of the buffalo they then walked up and we probably have them somewhere where my finger is right now in there so we kind of followed their footprints all the way along and then this part here we drove this block no tracks came out and so in here and so it was such a cool track because you could see where the buffalo had walked um and where they had gone and there was a little soft spot from the rain where you could see that they had stepped on little open patches of sand um well, this is all wet and very disgusting so let's put that back down there um and then like i said the buffalo dung itself um and then kind of going through and finding them and them not seeing you it's always the best thing when you're tracking is because ideally you don't want um, an animal to be disturbed by you uh, and i find lions funny enough if they're really sleeping they can be quite silly um, i've often walked very very close to lions without them waking up and not because you want to but just because it's thick and dense I and mean, you can see what the bush looks like here so when you're walking through this you can't see past some of this stuff it's only when you get around and there's like a little clearing does the head kind of move or a tail flicks or something like that and it makes it quite tricky so um, in this case, the only reason I didn't see them is, oh, you can't see it from here, but there's a termite mound and they were kind of up against the back of the termite mound, which is a good lesson for anybody that's wanting to become a guide and is learning about tracking, is when you're tracking, um, many animals will use mounds. So we know that elephant, rhino, buffalo, um, lion, leopard, they all like to go up onto mounds and, and the herbivores feed and the, and the carnivores rest on them or behind them. So when tracking, and if you're on tracks of, let's say, a lion pride or a leopard, and you can't see anything on top of the mound, don't just assume that they're not there because often they can be over the back. And as you come on the crest of that mound, because it's the one that everybody wants to do is to try to get some height and elevation to scan, is they crest the mound, and as soon as they crest, then you get a situation where the lines are right at your feet and it's much more dangerous. So always go round the mound, check that there's nothing there, and then you can approach the mound to see if the tracks go onto the mound and where they go from there. So it's a little tip. Anyway, we'll stay with our lines. They've just all gone flat again. And so in the meantime, while we stick with them and see what they get up to, let's send you back across to Ben with the wild dogs who I'm sure are going to get mobile fairly soon. Well, we still have some very sleepy puppies, um, and adults for that matter as well. You can just see some tawny colours in the grass there and some ears flicking, but we have not had a great deal of activity. Every now and again a head pops up, and that's about it. So we haven't got any further, I'm afraid, in trying to count how many adults 
and uh, and the pups we have here. We know we've definitely got at least two pups that I can say for sure we have seen two younger ones, um, and then yeah, somewhere between sort of six and eight adults, but we're still not quite sure. They're kind of sleeping just on the peripheries of a Tamboiti thicket, um, and they are kind of flat in the grass. And uh, you know we're not far away from them, but I don't want to go and drive too close to them purely to count them. I don't want to disturb them. They seem to be quite happy here. But if there is anybody who thinks they know who these or which pack this is, by all means, let us know. But I'm thinking now it's maybe not the same pack we had the other day, unless all the members weren't there. Because I think that last pack we had was four adults and two pups, but we've definitely got more than four adults here. But hopefully at some point they will get moving and we will be able to follow them best we can. I'm just very grateful we found them. They could have been absolutely anywhere, so really nice of them to have plonked themselves down not too far from the road. And it's not every day you get to see dogs on foot. They gave me a bit of a surprise. One was just staring at me when I came around the corner. Um, didn't even stand up though, so evidently they're quite used to being tracked on foot. And so not a great danger to, to humans, to be honest. I'm unaware of any attacks um, on wild dogs on people. I'm sure there have been, but it's not something you hear about very often. As I said, I think they've got a healthy fear of man because we have persecuted them. As I said before, they operate over such large areas, even in these sorts of areas, uh, can be up to a couple of thousand square kilometers. Uh, kilometer home range and up in East Africa where you've got all those open plains where there's far more space they can be up to maybe even 4,000 square kilometers in one home range of a dog. Uh, unless of course they've got pups for the first three months um, the female will, the alpha female, remember there's an alpha male and an alpha female and then the rest of them are subordinate but there'll be a pecking order between the males and the females within the pack and they will, um, when, they, when they've got cubs or pups, they will stay within a much smaller area around that den site and bring back food to the youngsters and to the alpha female and anybody else who's still at uh, the den site. So you're probably looking at reducing the amount of area travelled for a dog by about 90% during those three or four months. And then the pups, once they're big enough and strong enough around about that age, then they, they will run with the pack and they will just traverse that area systematically taking whatever they can find. All right, we've got a little bit of activity. A couple of them have got up. Let's have a look. Oh. All right, well, it looks like we've got Two individuals scratch at the back there. A scratch at the back of the back. Look at those lovely markings on his paws. I think everybody's having a, an, an ablute. Interesting to see whether they're deciding to get mobile or whether we're just having a communal bathroom break. But they certainly don't look particularly engorged. And so, but they could have taken something small. Mm, it looks like they have eaten something. There's a bit of a swelling to the belly, but not that recently so maybe they did take something earlier this morning and they've been happily digesting for a few hours and it's just subsided that sort of distended stomach nope, we've flopped down again nope and up nope <laughs> shame buddy no privacy At least the wind is blowing in our favour in this situation. Look at those incredible markings. Like a patchwork quilt. But brilliant camouflage. Not that they're particularly ambush hunters, they're, they're normally quite open in uh, when they're hunting they'll almost form like a, a phalanx a bit like sort of buffalo do they'll spread out into a into a line or i should say like lions do um and then they will just approach the prey and they will purposely disturb them and then they are pretty good at singling out a young or a weak or a sick looking animal and they will focus their attention on that animal 
And this whole idea of dogs running relays is a bit of a misnomer as well. It's just pretty much whoever's closest. And as the prey wheels to one way or the other, then other dogs are in a better position. Uh, they'll take over the hunt. Okay, so you can see this one does have a full belly, so they, they did eat earlier today. And I think they've just been say, sleeping it off this afternoon. But interesting, we've had three or four of them actually get up and uh, all use the bathroom sim uh, pretty much simultaneously. But you often find that in um, groups of animals where one exhibits a type of behaviour, the others all think, oh, that's a good idea, we'll do the same. And we actually find evidence of that quite regularly. For example, if you find a, a rhino midden or an impala midden, one of those sort of communal toilets that they'll use repeatedly, it's not unusual to find other animals having defecated on or around it as well. It's almost as if they sort of go through the bush and they see this pile of dung and go, oh, actually, you know what, that's not a bad idea. I should probably do the same. But it really, it's all that interlinked behaviour. It's kind of what we call allolomimetic behaviour, uh, which is a bit of a fancy word, but that we use that to describe in um, sort of social situations of animals when one animal starts to exhibit a particular type of behavior the rest of them often follow on as well okay but we are on the during on the hunt weekend so whilst we sit here with these dogs let's show you some footage of a hyena uh, chasing around some zebras in one of our previous sightings here on wild earth Well, very interesting scenes here. So there's just this one hyena amongst this herd of zebra and it's been giving chase to all of the young zebra, all of the young calves that are moving through. There's heaps of zebra coming through and there's just this one hyena that's been sitting in the grass trying to hunt a smaller zebra, all of the younger ones. It's had two goes now, it's had two attempts. Just They've just been short-lived chases, but it's uh, very strange. Welcome back to the beautiful Okokuyo. And we just had our second baby zebra. I think I can still show all of you. Just bear with me. It's just walking off, off with mommy. So of course our first baby foal that we saw or baby zebra that we saw was a very, very, very black and fluffy zebra. And this is now the second one I get to share with all of you and the second one that I see in Okokoyo. So very exciting. They just came for some water and now they are slowly moving off again. And as we've learned with a lot of the animals, you know, even though they are still a part of a herd or a pride or a harem, they will just separate themselves a little bit from the herd or the group or whatever they find themselves in. <laughs> and then she will join back up with the harem again but truly truly so incredible i've seen it suckling drinking water with mommy and it truly is so so amazing i'm very very happy about this but as i say here in ukukuyo we know of a very very black and fluffy zebra fall as well and uh, truly i've never seen a zebra with markings like this but this one seems to be very light in coloration not light but normal <laughs> in coloration and it's a pity we can't see the face now because they truly are one of my favorite baby animals i really love zebras but of course let us know what's your favorite baby animal i am very <laughs> i'm a hypocrite when it comes to when it comes to baby animals because I really do love all of them, zebras, lions, elephants, really anything. But I'm so, so happy I got to show all of you my baby zebra, <laughs> as they're slowly moving off now. 
So I will keep monitoring our beautiful water holes on the dam cams. And in the meantime, I'm going to send you over to Madikwe. Everybody, let me just quickly reposition. We've got something special that we hope we can align up for you. BK somewhere there, guys. We've got a caracal out here. It's going left. Guys, bear with me. I just want to reposition us. This road has washed away. But it is walking in the... Oh, let's go back again. Let's go back again and see if we can get a visual for you. Can you still see it, BK? I can't, huh? Mm. Oh, we can't. Guys, we had a caracal walking out here, which is super, super rare to see. But bear with us. I just want to try another angle on our right here. Maybe we've got a bit of a, a gap there, because we would love to bring this to you guys just bear with me and i'm gonna bk go in there and then turn in for you hopefully we still get a glimpse of him there at the back he's going just had a brief glimpse right at the back there somewhere <clears throat> I think our best chance, everyone, is we just sit here and scan out there for you. But uh, it was walking away from us. Garakal, the fourth largest cat. We do have some zebra walking over. Yes, Ruth, uh, definitely, uh, we would love to show you guys at Lips. Unfortunately, where we are, the road has washed away right up ahead of us here. Otherwise, we definitely we would have found him again. And it was super relaxed. Just before you guys came to us, it actually looked at us. We've got some zebra walking into shot, and I'm scanning with my binoculars. Fingers crossed, it might actually just appear somewhere again. So caracal guys, a tawny color, I would say the best, if you don't know what a caracal looks like, the best way to describe it, it looks like a puma, but a small one, an American mountain lion, um, but a smaller version of it. And then with very, these tufted ears, these long hair tufts on the top of the ears. It's your fourth largest cat out here, lion. Leopard and cheetah, from a shoulder height point of view, roughly the same. And then caracal. BK scanning, arm scanning. Want to try another angle again, BK? But I think this is our the, the most open. Okay, guys, we're going to continue searching, and hopefully, we do. You will come back to us. In the uh, meantime, let's uh, head over to Tristan and his lions. That zebra is looking at it. You see? Uh -huh. Well, that's where we're going to look. I hope that Kevin finds a caracal. That's not something you see every day. So it'd be really, really cool if he manages to get it. I'll be quite jealous that he managed to actually see one already. Anyway, we're still sitting with our, our lions at the moment. We have a lioness that has decided that she's going to park her bottom 
directly in front of the car. Um, I don't even think you'll get her on camera. That's how close she is in front of the vehicle. She's just walked here all of a sudden and lay down. Um, and Paul, do you think you can get her or not? You might just get the tops of her ears. Let's try, come, let's see what we can find here. <laughs> just to show you how sometimes it's not us that parks close. I mean, you can see I was far away from them. They were all parked there. So this is the front of the vehicle and there, maybe you can just see between the steering wheel is an ear of a lioness um, and her bum is out and her tail is basically underneath the front of the vehicle at the moment. So it gives you an idea of sometimes how close they come and with no door, I mean, you can see there's no door here on the right. If she she comes around she's going to be rather close but it's okay it's fine she's not perturbed by us at all if she was she wouldn't lay with her back to me and facing away she would lie facing me just to make sure that I'm not a threat at all it's pretty cool when you get lions come quite close you get a really good appreciation of just how big they actually are they really are quite large anyway the rest of the pride is still milling about and lying down and doing their thing um, now we were asking our quiz earlier, our second question of the afternoon about black herons um, and Carol Kay, congratulations, you are the winner for quiz number two. Um, you said that black herons, in order to use an interesting sort of hunting technique, is that they spread their wings around in a little circular shape and they create a shadowed area where fish will come into seeking shelter and it then is able to grab the fish and it's a pretty cool thing to watch um see it quite a lot if you go up into botswana um in Zocabanga delta lots of them there um also where else have i seen a lot of them uh, salu plenty in the salu um yeah various places actually they zambia spread around through there but the delta really is the best viewing i've had of them uh, they go through those little marshy areas and kind of bring their wings around and then hunt like that and it's fun to watch them it's, there's that very interesting oh, funny little clip that's daytime nighttime i'm sure some of you have seen of a heron kind of putting the wings out and it's nighttime and daytime um there's a little gif that went around for a while whatever you want to call it um anyway s8 is starting to yawn a little bit um Come on, boy, give us a give us a roar because you've been so naughty at roaring every time we're not on camera. He hasn't roared this afternoon yet, but yesterday morning he did it. I don't know how many times. Yes, listen to us. Oh, he looks beautiful when he puts his head up, doesn't he? It's a big line that he uh, might be on his own, but he certainly is an impressive individual. Um, there's no ifs or buts about it. Um, one thing about the, the sort of dark main tribute yesterday is that uh, we had a look at some footage of him of old. It was amazing actually how big dark main's mane was at one point. I mean, he resembled much of what uh, S8's mane looks like now. Um, just prior to that leg injury, um, he looked really, really good. And then after that for a while, um, Gert and I were actually talking about, we had a crazy sighting on Torchwood of him and we sat on the rocks and he uh well we were parked on the rock next to the rocks and he was on the rocks and he walked straight at us at eye level much like the distance that we have this lioness and you realize very quickly then how big a lion is i mean he he was standing his paws were at the same height as where the door would be for me so his head was over the top of my head basically and he was just looking at us from like two three meters away it was very very cool to see um so yeah i'll never forget that but s8 is definitely a big big boy um a nice looking male all right let's see the lions keep sort of head up down head up down so we'll stay with them i'm sure they'll get going eventually here at wild earth we strive to show you that animals have emotions like humans do and this festive season we are celebrating their sentience with our new Animals Have Emotions range. Help us bring awareness to animals this Christmas with our new designs that launch on Black Friday at a discounted price. Because empathy for animals is the key in the conservation mission. Head to the Wild Earth shop to find out more.
Alrighty, well our dogs are still fairly stationary. We haven't had much movement, but at least we've got a, one or two heads up. We're still trying to get a view for the... Oh, one of the pups is actually up. I don't know, is he going to... hope he's not going to be behind the pole with this rain roof on. He might just be able to get a glimpse of one of the pups. Here he is. <laughs> Playing hide and seek behind the bushes. There we go. You're going to have a little bit of a greet. So at least two pups, we think possibly three pups now. But maybe if one starts moving, perhaps the others will come out as well and we can get a better idea of numbers. Oh, you're going to be right behind <laughs> the post. Hello, little pup. Also got a nice full belly. I'm glad you're enjoying it, Joey. It's a lovely sighting at the moment. We seem to have shown you more pictures of dogs defecating than anything else so far this afternoon, but that's the way nature works sometimes. Uh, but yeah, always very, very special uh, to see these animals. A beautiful white tail on this one. I see our quiz is going well, so we are just entering the third hour of the Sunset Safari, so time to give you your next quiz. Remember, send your name and email addresses in along with your answers and we will see who wins the next one. So this is kind of a three-part question. We need three answers here. Uh, what are the three main methods that spiders use to catch their prey? Of course, there are potentially lots more than that, but they're sort of categorised into three main methods. So if you think you know the answer or have any suggestions, please do send in your answers Oop. and your name and your email address and maybe you get it right and maybe you win a t-shirt so please do send in your answers and any other questions or comments that you have as well you can hear that incredible noise that dogs make they sound like birds chirping very unusual See, built very differently from the other predators. Much sleeker, only around about 30 kilograms for a dog. And one of the reasons that they have that ability to uh, can sort of keep food in their stomach and as long as they don't rest for too long, that metabolism um, doesn't start the digestive process because they can't, unlike hyenas and things which have those massive necks and forequarters designed for picking things up and dragging things uh, whilst scavenging and taking things back to den sites, dogs can't do that. They're not physiologically equipped to carry heavy objects over distances. They're very much built for speed. Oh, that one's got a stick. <laughs> See, dogs do play with sticks. Uh, so that's a brilliant adaptation. Rather than having to drag food back to the den site for your pups or the alpha female or any sick or injured ones, rather transported in your stomach. Much, much simpler. Uh, love our guides. Love your name, by the way. Um, how do we know which is the alpha male and female? To be honest, it's very difficult because there's no obvious uh, difference in terms of what they look like or their sizes. It's all done on dominance. You really just have to look at body language. Um, there will be submission shown um, towards the more dominant members of the pack. So it's very difficult to know unless you could, once they've been identified with all the dogs having these very unique markings, um, you would be able to recognize their alpha pair again once you know who they are. But you would only really be able to establish that by watching them. Uh, and of course, if there is a female with pups, then that is going to be the alpha female. Sometimes the beta female can fall pregnant and can also produce pups. And there have been various different records of what happens. Uh, they have been chased out by the alpha female. There have been rare occasions where um, the alpha female has 
killed the pups of a beta female. Um, there's even one or two recorded cases of the beta female being chased off or uh, removed by the alpha female. And then uh, if she doesn't take out those pups, then there have been cases where she has adopted those pups and, uh, and raised them herself. I've also heard stories of if the alpha female um, does kill the, the beta female's pups and she is still producing milk, that she will then uh, also help to suckle the alpha female's pups. But yes, there's no way to obviously tell. Unfortunately, they don't come with a big flashing neon sign above their head saying alpha. Um, so you've really just got to watch their interactions with each other to be sure. This one seems to be gnawing on his stick. Very canine traits. Whether or not this is just to keep the teeth sharp and in good condition, or whether or not this is just play and exercise for the jaw muscles, I'm not really sure. But certainly dogs that I've had over the years as well have a tendency to have a stick and then they'll just rip it into shreds and seem to be quite content doing that for a period of time. Up, down, up, down. Seems to be very happy playing with a stick. What's well, definitely a day for youngsters to be playful today after what we had with the um, uh, with the telemates this morning as well. We had such a nice time with their cubs. Let's just see what this little one's up to now. Nice that we're finally getting a little bit of movement. The adults are up and down a few times, but now we're having a quick sniff. What have you got there, little one? Something of interest in there. I wonder if it's just an interesting smell or whether we've got another... Have we got another play thing? We've got another stick. <laughs> OK, we're going to sit with these dogs for a little while. Let's send you up to Medikwe and to Kevin. We are here with one of Madikwe's gentle giants. This elephant bull is just so relaxed, he's feeding 20 meters from us, and it will be a brilliant opportunity to show you him up close and personal. Look at that mud and leaves and all the crustiness there on his back. You can have a look at the way he's feeding. I might have to reap it. Look at that. You see all the mud and there's some leaves and everything on his back there. Very humble to be so close to a big elephant bull that's so relaxed. Great experience. BK, can you pick up that green tinge there on his on his trunk as he goes past? Beautiful, thank you. Look how that trunk is stained. And if you look closely, it's only on the one side. It's only on his right hand side. Because they tend to use the trunk in one direction only, either left-handed or right-handed. Yes, elephants are left tusked or right tusked or they use their trunk in one direction. You see there, the green is only on the one side. So they keep on turning it in the one direction as they're pulling out grass, as you can see there. Look at him, he's going to flick it to get some of the dirt off it. Now you can see how dexterous that trunk is. Eh? And you can 
actually hear him chewing. Terry, elephants will find a favorite rubbing tree. So they will they love after they've had a mud bath. As soon as the mud dries, they will go and look at his ear, Terry. If BK just scrolls up a bit for us, look at the side of his ear. You can see there a little bit higher, please, B. You can see that scrape mark. There, where he was scraping against a tree. So, and they've got these favorite ones. It's normally close to water holes, Terry. And you'll see, when you look at the trees, you'll see the bark is all smoothly worn away. And they will get rub up against it, and that is how they get rid of the mud. I just want to get slightly ahead of him again. So I can show you guys a front on view. So I'm quickly going to start off, reposition us, bear with us. I do constantly read the elephant behavior for any signs of him not happy with our presence. And if I do pick up any of that, we will leave him in peace. We're going to get slightly ahead of him. An unusual view of the Drakensberg Mountains, the northern or or used to be called the Transvaal Drakensberg. Just love this scene. Those clouds rolling off the top. Absolutely gorgeous. You can even see some of the cliffs. And as much as we want to see animals and we want to, you know, experience safari, this is all part of it. You know, these views really adds another dimension to your safari and I often stare at these mountains. Now I live in the town called Hoodsbrad which is right pretty much close to where you look at now and we are a little probably about 10 or 12 kilometers closer to those mountains so I've got a lovely view at home of these mountains. So when I'm home I'm just often in the afternoon just stare at them. And on very clear days, you can even see the lichen, the green lichen on those cliffs. Absolutely gorgeous. And there we can see the lion head, or Chuaneng Hill. Or and unfortunately from where we are, we can't see Maripskop, it's covered by trees. But Twining Hill marks the northern exit point of the Blyder River Canyon. And I often emphasize on this is to take in the scenery when you're on safari absorb it and take it in it will just mm. elephants have made a mess in here bro well we're just trying to just keep up with the pride a little bit they're not gone far they're lying on a mound now so I'm hoping that they're going to lie nicely. Um, they decided to move a little bit. S8 hasn't come yet, but the rest of the pride is moving. And there's like a little fallen over tree. So I was hoping that with the fallen over tree, we would get them playing a little bit, much like 
I believe they were this morning. Chayat and Ben were telling me that they uh, had a nice game this morning. Let's see. A bit of a stretch. I have to just stop here for a second because you see this cub here. If I go over this bush, it's going to give that cub a fright. So I just want the cubs to go and settle with moms and then we'll figure out our place. But there we go. Up on the mound is what we wanted, just like yesterday. Yeah, I'm sure they're going to sit down. I'm sure cubs will sit down. I'm sure everybody's going to find their little respective spots and then it will be a beautiful, beautiful scene. Um, like I say, we just need to find a spot. That's a bit better. All right, since this cub's not moving and is just going to sleep, I'm just going to do a slight reposition here for M4. Sorry, M4. Just got to move this car, which is a lot bigger than what Rusty and Wendy are. So we do a couple more turns. Here comes old S80. He's coming to join the fray. How's that import better? Is that good? Have you got a gap through there? Even Impor is happy. And if Impor is happy, guys, then I am happy. Um, but yeah, they're just slowly starting to kind of move into nice areas. I mean, obviously on the mound is as good as we can ask for. And you can see how they're just watching SA to arrive. He won't go up on the mound. Uh, it's very seldom that we sell lines on mounds um, they typically like to to lie at the bottom and then the um you find that the the cubs and the females up on the mound itself i don't know what it is about mounds that they're not a huge fan of when they're young males they love it but as soon as they get big they prefer just lying flat down on the ground which i suppose i can understand um given the the size of them and you know mounds are obviously quite tricky um, to negotiate from a big mane, big body. No, it's not always as easy. Nice though with the other little one, just on there. It's a very, very cool sighting. I was hoping they were going to play on the little log that's in front there, but it doesn't seem like anyone's too interested. Oh, now you move. Okay, well... It's all right, we'll figure out the movement with them a little bit later and see where we'll position ourselves. Safari fan. Is a safari fan, you're asking about the brown markings above a lion's eyes. It's almost just like two little lines that come up. The purpose, no real purpose to it. Um, that I know of. It could maybe potentially be something to do with flies. There could be a fly function there somewhere. Often darker markings are more attractive to flies. Um, but yeah, I've never read anything about it. Never seen anyone or heard anyone talk about it. So yeah, I'm not 100% sure. Um, interesting question though. Well worth a bit more of an investigation. Maybe Ben or Kevin um, has an answer. Uh, or Chris, but I certainly have never come across anything that talks about the little brown marking above the eyes. Um, maybe it's a little bit of a disruptive pattern as well, just to help camouflage a bit better, particularly around the eye area. I'm not sure. Um, I'll try and do a bit of digging and see if I can come up with anything. But yeah, I'm not definitely haven't read of anything or heard of anything that would uh, would give a bit more of a sort of view on that she looks comfy doesn't she <laughs> it's cool when you find them all like lying like this and they don't look like they're in too much of a rush do they to go anywhere It'd be interesting to see how far they move tonight because they didn't go anywhere yesterday really I mean, their, their movement was around quarantine down to Gari Dam, and that's it. I mean, where they were found this morning, where compared to where we found them yesterday morning, was, I mean, you could throw a rock between the two locations. It's only probably 150 meters, 200 meters. 
apart from where they were. They obviously did a bit of a loop, but it just goes to show that they didn't go very far. So I'm interested to see what their movement is tonight. Typically lions um, move a little bit more than they did, given that they weren't exactly full bellied. Um, but maybe they last night were chasing impalas around quarantine. Uh, there were lots of impala lambs around there or they were hoping that zebras or something like that came i don't know but it was quite strange to see them not move too much uh, during the course of uh, last night so we'll see what like i say what happens this evening i suspect they're going to cross into buffalo's hook tonight we're so close to the boundary here and where the buffalo went um, would be be a bit shocked if they were still in this area they might go to buffalo's hook dam i suppose it's possible tomorrow morning they pitch up there um, but I expect them to be a little bit further. They're definitely starting to get hungry now, so food will be starting to weigh on their minds a little bit. And therefore, we need to start heading into a bit more of an active mode. It's quite cool with the little sort of window through the bush to all of these lions that are sort of cuddled up on the edge of a mound. Very, very cute. <laughs> lots and lots and lots of ticks in this grass. When I was when I got back to the car after tracking, I was absolutely tick bites everywhere. I don't know, ticks and I are not friends. We I get absolutely smashed by them. Um, and I was showing Impor when we were sitting with the lions now, there was a blade of grass next to me and it was, I don't know, what, what do you think Impor? 10, 15 ticks on there? Something like that. Um, all on the edge of the grass, little small ticks. Um, so when you walk through that, they will just latch onto you and start to, to kind of feed on you. And because they're so tiny, you can often miss them. Um, I mean, Ben was saying, telling an extreme story, I believe, you last night um, about using fire to get rid of them. It's far easier just to use a quarry bush, but um, can to get to these lines in case they moved. I didn't grab a quarry bush on my way, um, so I just had to use my hand for now, which means I've invariably missed some somewhere along the stretch. Um, but I'll sort it out when I get home. Hopefully, by then they haven't embedded themselves, which they sometimes do. All right, I'm gonna just reposition slightly just so we have a slight bit of more movement for Impor to work with. And while I do that, it sends you across to Ben because I'm sure it's almost time for those wild dogs to get mobile. Well, we have some wild dog pups. And as you can see, this one is pretty much checking out the interesting smells on our front wheels. Uh, incredible to be able to get so up close and personal with these animals. They are fearless of the vehicle, particularly the pups have grown up with the vehicles because the adults are relaxed with the vehicles. They have not developed any particular aversion to us. And that's say, as always say, that's testament to the way things are conducted in the reserve here, in the surrounding reserves. The last thing we want to do is allow those animals to have any negative associations with us, but we're slowly being surrounded by dogs. But one, or, one or two of the adults now are beginning to get on the move as well. I wonder if it's time to move on. One adult's going back towards the road, so potentially one of the alphas. Two of the cubs, two of the pups are following and a couple of the other adults are now up. So it looks like it might be time to get moving. We'll have to see if Rusty can keep up if they do their dog thing. See one of the youngsters there just looking to see if the rest of the adults are coming. Looks like there's a, a little bit of a greeting ceremony going on on the right. More sort of precursors to movement, a little bit of social bonding. And then I think we're probably going to get going. I wonder if they're going to go for water. We did have evidence that they were drinking out of a puddle somewhere on the road when we were following the tracks, but I think they've been laid up here for quite a while. So let's see what happens. 
Whilst we wait to see what happens here, we are going to show you another one of our On The Hunt clips. A uh, warning to sensitive viewers, this one is quite graphic. Uh, a couple of lionesses uh, that had a, well, took out a warthog up in the Mara. So if you are of a sensitive nature, maybe don't watch. Um, oh, hang on, before we do that though, let's just watch what's going on here. We've got some interaction with the dogs. Might be able to hear them. I don't want to move the vehicle and disturb them. We're only a few meters away from them now. How cool is this? Can you hear all the noise? Those high pitched cheeping, so undog like. This is definitely a precursor to movement. I think in the next few minutes we will be trying to keep up with them. Hello, doggy. So lucky to be so close. Their wonderful family ethos here. <laughs> totally, you're right, they, they do sound like they've swallowed, swallowed all of those squeaky dog toys that you get. Very high pitched, so they have a variety of noises, of, of course. They can bark, sometimes under stress, although I've never heard it. Otherwise it's that characteristic sort of whoop whoop noise when an individual gets separated. Right behind that post, let me just see if, let me just see if we can drop back without starting the engine. Ooh, ooh. This is the problem when you move without starting the engine, they're not used to that noise. So sometimes they do react, they get a bit of a fright, they normally associate the noise of the engine. That's touch and go, do you want to start the engine and move and disturb everything? Or do you want to just drop back quietly and then that also disturbs them. So, But they've chosen to do this about, as you can see, about three metres away from the car. scratch. We still don't have an ID on this pack now that we can see them a little bit more clearly. If anybody does know, do you let, please do let me know. It's not the same pack that we had last weekend, definitely not, because they only had two pups uh, and there were only six in that pack and there's a lot more dogs than that here. Looks like they're slowly beginning to head back towards the road, towards Shortcut Gallagher. I wonder if they're going to go to Gallagher Pan for a drink. I think while we wait to see what happens here, because they're going to uh, slowly get mobile now, let's quickly send you over to, to watch that clip. As I said, if you are of a sensitive nature, maybe don't watch for the next minute or so. Um, let's show you that interaction up in the Mara. But when, when you come back, hopefully these dogs will be on the move and we will be able to be following them. We are sitting here live and these two lioness have just got a warthog. The warthog is still alive at this moment and one lioness is trying to strangle it around its throat and the other lioness is opening down. But they obviously took this warthog by surprise. She looks like she's strangleholding it. Yeah. 
and they're off. The lioness that had the stronger grip is off. She's trying to take the warthog for herself and the other lioness is following. There's only half the body left at the moment and you can see that they're both fighting over it. One definitely has a better grip. She's been trying to get that grip for some time. Three vultures coming in to try and see exactly what they can get. Now they're gonna eat fast, they're gonna gorge themselves because they know at any minute if these lions stand up it could be a potential threat and they will go back to the air where it's safe. All right, the dogs have moved. They've gone back towards the road. Uh, obviously there are a couple of other vehicles here just the way we were situated. Uh, we weren't able to get out very quickly so I'm not sure if they're on the road in front of us uh, or not. Oh yeah, just see them in the distance trotting down the road. But I'm going to give them plenty of space here. We can't see with the other vehicles in the way, but what we, what we normally do is we'll sort of leapfrog and everyone will get an opportunity to view them. Uh, otherwise, yeah, that was quite a harrowing clip, so apologies if that uh, upset anybody. But that is the way of things out here, but particularly with warthogs. Uh, it was the very first kill I ever saw from lions, it was also a warthog kill, and it was very much a, a baptism of fire. Uh, because you saw there, the warthog's neck is so thick that it's not really possible uh, for the lions to clamp down and cut off the blood supply, uh, the oxygen supply, and uh, therefore what you some you end up with the pretty much pinning the thing down, uh, and it's pretty brutal. Those warthogs squeal, um, yeah, and I'll never forget that. My first ever uh, lion kill was a warthog. There. Pretty excessive, very similar actually to the way that dogs hunt. They're also not strong enough to be able to clamp down on the windpipe of the prey animal and they pretty much just pin it down and do what needs to be done. Okay, let's see if we can squeeze past this vehicle here. Sorry guys, do you mind if I just pull in there? Thank you. Oh, no, they're still moving. Let's see if we can't leapfrog our way to the front. Aha. So they've had a drink from a puddle now, so I don't think they're going to bother going to Galago Pan, but they are heading down towards quarantine. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight adults and three pups, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, it looks like eight adults and three pups. So we know there's plenty of impala down on quarantine if they get that far. But so they do have nice full stomachs. But they eat a lot. Um, so a pack this size would not unusual to take out, say, two impalas a day. Very fast metabolism and they digest very, very quickly. So now up in Medikwe, for example, there, um, you know, they've got a good proportion of dogs up there. Uh, and, you know, they can take... One pack of dogs up there can take a thousand impala a year, three a day potentially for a big pack. And when you think about that, you can see why actually reserves can't handle very uh, too many dogs, and they do need massive areas. A thousand impala a year is quite a substantial population loss just to one species, don't forget, and one group of one species at that. Okay, let's carry on we're going to have to play a little bit of leapfrog with the other vehicles give everybody an opportunity to view so we'll have a, a little look as they go down the road and then i'll let one of the other vehicles come in front of us or if possible i'm going to try and get in front of the dogs but it's always a risky business to play because if they see something and they bolt off into the bushes it's very very difficult to keep up with them i'm just going to pull over to one side and let, make sure the other vehicles can also see might let one go past here. We have to play nice, unfortunately. I know we'd love to keep them to ourselves, but um, yeah, we've got to share and we all work together as a team. Keep me one most welcome. It is a lovely sighting indeed, so always a treat to spend time with these animals. Okay, as you can see, we Keep it to three vehicles in the sighting here with dogs. 
Um, so we may have to make some space for... Well, there's one over there, Rian. I don't know if you can pick that one out through the tree. Also having an ablution moment. And catch up with the rest of the pack. OK, we are going to see if we can work another opening here with these dogs. Uh, in the meantime, let's send you over to Tristan and see what those lions are up to. Well, I mean, we're far more relaxed on this side and not so difficult. Um, to sit with lions on a mound as opposed to wild dogs that are starting to get moving and I'm sure it's going to be a bit of a bloodbath on quarantine if they go there because unfortunately lots of impala lambs and wild dogs and impala lambs are just uh, it just does never goes well I'm afraid um, so if you are sensitive and the dogs do get to quarantine and they are impala lambs I suggest potentially not watching um, because the reality is is that they should be quite successful in, uh, in getting a meal there anyway our, our lions as you can see haven't really done much bit of yawning now from one or two of the females so they're starting to slowly look like they might wake up a bit um, but cubs are out cold males out cold so for now it's just all very relaxed on this side of the world be interesting to see if the dogs make kills and there's a lot of commotion with the hyenas because um, the hyenas will be there invariably if the dogs do make kills um, whether these lions get up and try and run back towards quarantine I can actually hear Indabele calling now she's got that very odd call calling from far sounds like somewhere close to Gari Main see how the lions all popping up their head as they listen to the hyena roar I mean saw and not saw roar or call is the word I was looking for get there eventually um, but if they hear the dogs and hyenas in commotion and lots of cackling and giggling uh, you might find lions running straight there they, if they know there's an opportunity for food it's very possible that they head in that direction so we'll just have to see what happens and whether or not um, they head that way Amazes me that they pop their heads up. Listen, eh, it's nothing to concern me, and back to sleep they go. Right now, we saw earlier the sausage tree pride being opportunistic in a buffalo hunt and getting it right in a muddy wallow. Um, they didn't always require mud, uh, as David Gitu managed to stay with them as they once again went after some more buffalo. Welcome back, and the hunt is on. This very injured buffalo is under siege by the sausage tree pride. I am here witnessing this life happening. These, there we go. One female has put anchor. Yeah, and that call might attract the others. Yeah, they're all on him. They're biting, he's going down, he's going down, he's gone down. Okay, this might be over because you're gonna see one is gonna like bite him all the way to the neck and then it's gonna be over. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. This. Um, Kill was worth it for these lionesses. They waited for a very long time. Well, as you can see, the sausage tree pride became somewhat of a specialist group when it came to hunting buffalo. Um, and that's the thing about the Masamara that a lot of people forget is that, yes, the lions have it good when there's the migration is in town, but the migration is not there for long, particularly in the Kenya side. If you compare it, well, actually anywhere in the Serengeti too, the migration doesn't really ever stop moving for long. 
Um, so they have a small window to take advantage of that. Outside of that, they've got to find food. Now, the Mara, while it is exceptionally beautiful and is dense with elephants and, and things, um, from a prey perspective, it's actually quite tricky. Um, Topi are incredibly keen-sighted and they sit on mounds and they watch for things like lions and are very fast. So they're tough when it comes to, to keeping up with them or trying to hunt them. Um, something like a Thompson's gazelle is too small. Not a lot of Grant's gazelle in the Mara. Um, they're, they're more Serengeti side as once you get into the central and southern parts of the Serengeti. Um, and then, you know, zebra and wildebeest aren't really there. So they have to then start to... Warthogs was no longer a viable option for them. Um, as much as it would have been nice to hunt a warthog because it's much safer, they just had too many members within the pride to go after just um, warthogs. And so they started to turn their attention to buffalo. And Kinky Tail and the rest became exceptionally, exceptionally good at um, hunting them. It was amazing actually to watch them and the process of them um, stalking, getting around buffalo and just basically cornering them and then just the pride and the numbers um, did the job after that. They would just wear down buffalo and you saw in that clip how it was just a constant battle between them. All right, well, we'll sit with our lions obviously a little while longer. Um, we're going to try and see if we can see them get up and move. Hopefully they'll head to Biffelzook Dam. Um, but we'll see how it goes. This is what I love about lionesses. Okay, so these dogs are on quarantine now. I think they're just deciding what to do because we thought we were going to get uh, something very exciting there because uh, uh, an Impala ram pretty much walked into them and they did chase him, but not really for like longer than about 50 meters. And to be honest, none of them really accelerated. Uh, whether they decided that a male was not worth the potential danger with the horns on its own, 
and they'd rather say so going to perhaps go and find a herd with some youngsters in and less horns to potentially impale them. We'll have to wait and see, but it was somewhat of a, a lacklustre attempt to chase after that male, which I'm very surprised because, I mean, he pretty much walked straight into them. They were only about 50 metres away, uh, which is normally all the dogs would need, but they didn't really commit to the hunt. OK, but it looks like they're on the move again. Let's see where they end up. There's normally plenty of impala around quarantine, so we might get some action here. So nice to see lots of dogs as well. So the other, uh, the other last weekend when I had them, we were only four adults, and the, the zebras were chasing the dogs around just as much as the dogs were chasing the zebra. But very cool to see them just gliding across quarantine in front of us here. The wind is very much in their favour as well. The wind is blowing from left to right as you are watching on the screen, so it should be blowing the scent of impala in their general direction. Strangely, I didn't even hear the male impala snort. I think he just got such a shock that he just bolted. Oh, oh, there's a baby impala. There's a baby impala on the right there after it. They found a, a young bit impala like, but I think, yes, that thing is quick. Was it a steenbok? Okay, it may have been a steenbok. It looked small and young, whatever it was, but it was motoring. But that's also escaped. Oh, now they're coming back again. <laughs> Always exciting trying to figure out what dogs are going to do and where they're going to go. Oh, they look like a young impala, but so the Chetan Rian are higher up than I am, so they say steenbok, whatever it was, was flying through the bushes and managed to escape. That's definitely activity time, though. We were having a debate earlier, Tristan and I and Tess, actually, before we came out, about the hunting success of dogs, which is considered to be sort of up to 70, 80, 90 percent, depending on what you read. But as you can see, we've just seen two kind of failed hunts, actually. So it's a little bit skewed that what tends to happen if you actually look at their success rate for an individual animal they chase it's not particularly good but if they find a big herd of animals and they scatter them they might chase multiple animals within the herd um, and then their chances of success is an awful lot higher but for individual animals like that uh, it's not as good as you might think and in fact it's pretty low See, they haven't locked on to anything yet. Uh, Moondust, very difficult to answer that question as always. I mean, look, lions take a variety of prey. Wild dogs, the majority of the prey they take are smaller antelope like impala and dacre and steenbok and things along those lines. And then they work very well as a unit, even though there's not actual sort of teamwork as such. What dogs do is they have great stamina. Uh, they are able to just follow that animal and chase it and chase it and chase it until the animal ultimately kind of gives up. Lions are built for power. Dogs are built for endurance. So a lion will stalk as close as it possibly can, spring the trap, and then, you know, they've got maybe a hundred meters to catch that animal. And if they fail, they need to stop because their bodies just can't handle it. They're, they're like bodybuilders. They're not uh, long distance runners. Whereas dogs, you can see much sleeker, much uh, built for athleticism, not for strength. So they can just run and run and run and run and say it's, uh, it's stamina. For the dogs, so it's sort of power versus stamina between the two. Let's just move forward a touch so we can get a bit closer. We're quite far behind now. So don't forget moon dust as well. These some of these figures that you read, I mean they're skewed. We've there are certain lion prides which are incredibly adept hunters and have far better. Uh, success rate than others and the same will be true of dogs and hyenas and leopards a lot of it is sort of individually dictated by well a bit of good fortune look at them all playing in the puddle 
Um, and yeah, co you know, coincidence. If there's a lot of this time of year as well, their success rates should be better because there, there are heavily pregnant females, there are uh, lambs everywhere. So this time of year should be much better for them. <laughs> A bit of a skip. They're wary of crocodiles, but I don't think they need to worry about crocodiles in here. But they are often very careful when they come down to drink. They they know that crocodiles can lay in wait in larger bodies of water. <laughs> you can see the Dumbetta House sign there. Jordan indeed, this is a puddle party. Uh, who let the dogs out indeed? <laughs> oh, that's also classic dog behavior. They do like to lie in puddles just like your dog does at home. Of course, all related to the wolves, and one of their other names is the painted wolf. In fact, their Latin name, Lysenon pictus, basically means painted wolf. So that herd mentality is certainly still there, or pack mentality, I should say. <laughs> You're checking out the sign? I wonder if something had scent marks on that. It is a fairly obvious... Uh, thing in a territory to scent mark on. Perhaps there was an interesting smell, but look at the activity. They've got some energy now. All right, let's follow them down the road a little bit. Which will drive through their puddle of fun that they were enjoying just now. These dogs have just spotted a huge herd of impala and they're off. You'll have to bear with us. We're going to try and keep up with them, but I'm already going... Well, my speedometer doesn't work, but I'm going quite fast now. <laughs> we're going to try and keep with the camera on them. Uh, but they were quite far away from the impala, so unless they've isolated uh, any individuals, or there's a sick or weak one at the back there, I think those impalas are going to get away. They started chasing them from probably well over 100 meters. Yeah, I think the impalas have got away. Unless they've got it. Oh, have they got. Is there a lamb there? Did they get a lamb? No, I don't think so. What are they sniffing there? What have they got there? Yeah, can you see? Anything very interested in that little. No, obviously nothing of interest. Okay, now we need to turn around again. Fun and games with the dogs, eh? Which way are they going to go? They're kind of now in between Wahlberg's Nest and Philemon's, uh, Philemon's Dip. Oh, no, we've changed our minds again. We're turning around. What have we seen now? <laughs> They're now running back across quarantine from whence they've came. This is where I get a good workout as well. The guys in the back have to hold on for dear life. Was it just, I think, possibly just one of the other members that they've lost as they've just regrouped? Oh, no, they've got something. They've got something. They're pulling something apart. Probably a young impala, unfortunately. I think they got an impala lamb. Oh, 
Well, welcome back, everybody. It's been a very exciting two minutes. We didn't see it happen, but as you can see there, one of the dogs, there must have been separate. We were with the majority of them, and then the rest of the pack suddenly went running back onto quarantine, and you can see there's what's left of, looks like a little impala lamb there. But there are so many of them around at the moment, and it's fairly easy pickings for a pack of dogs like this, but that won't go very far between what is eight adults and three pups, I think. Shame. Sorry about the impala lamb there, but that is what dogs do, and they are an important controlling factor. We know we've got a lot of impala, and they do form the basis of many of our carnivores' food requirements out here. I think that's what's left of the carcass. There's very little left already, as you can see. But it would have been quick, that's at least we know for sure. But not sure who got it, so the rest of the the rest of the pack were down with us and then they all came bolting back up and I think one of them must have come across one perhaps lying in the grass, maybe it hunkered down and uh, tried to hide and unsuccessfully. Indeed it was quickly some rear. It's always exciting uh, to spend time with dogs. Um, they, they just never stop and when they're on the hunt it's very, very difficult to stay with them. You can hear that one of them's picked up and running off with it. <laughs> What you got there for? A what what? Oh, there is two. There's a leopard lying on the termite mound over there. <laughs> it's all happening on quarantine. What dogs, leopards? There's some of the leopard watching all of this. Uh, happen or see if we can get you a view of both. That's incredible. Wow, what are the chances? Okay, let's try and work something here. You might get the occasional post, everybody. Dogs in front, dogs to the left, and a leopard lying on the termite mound in the distance as well. So we don't know where to point the camera. This leopard is just watching, he's got no interest in uh, chasing in here. <laughs> Let's just show you the leopard quickly and see if we can see who it is. Look, look, look. look. The leopard just chilling, watching what's going on here. What are the chances? So, uh, leopard taking, we're also watching the dogs, the leopard's watching the dogs. Wow, that does not happen every day. Well, I'll keep an eye on the leopard. We'll watch the dogs for now, obviously, because of the activity, and we'll see if, if we see that leopard move, we'll go back to him or her. I couldn't even see. It's far too exciting. This one's got a leg in front of us here. What an incredible few minutes. I said this morning when we came out, as we were following up on those dog tracks, I saw male leopard tracks uh, as well coming towards quarantine. It's, yeah, we've just just heard, thank you Shreyas, it does look like Mawati, I also agree with you though, just from what I saw, always come off the termite mound already. The other vehicle's gone to the Leopard, we'll see if he sticks with them, but we all know that Mawati is not a great fan of uh, being followed. So I'm going to stick with the dogs for now, and we'll see if we can get another look at Mawati. But there were tracks coming in on Voyatella access towards quarantine, whilst we were following up on those dogs. I can't believe it, dogs and leopard in the same sighting. Wow. So you can see a couple of dogs, looks like they've all separated. Unfortunately, the impala has been sort of systematically dismantled and I can see about five or six individual dogs that have all got something that they're chomping on. Nicole, it is incredible. I, I don't know what to say. I mean, doesn't, that doesn't happen every day. I've been fortunate enough to see leopards and dogs a few times together, but not for a long time. I, I've told this story before, but I remember one from uh, 
when I was working in, in the western sector of the Sabi Sands where we had mating leopards and dogs and lions basically all in the same sighting. That was insane. Having seen absolutely nothing for about two hours, found one leopard, found a second leopard, watched the mating, a pack of dogs came in, chased the leopards up two individual separate trees and then all the commotion brought lions in and the lions chased the dogs off and chased, you know, ran around the tree for the leopards and then everything sort of settled again but you just never know what's going to happen. bit of a disturbance from all the lapwings in the distance as well, which I don't think has anything to do with the dogs unless some of them have moved down there. The way it's going, maybe we'll have a lion walk into the fray as well. <laughs> Could you imagine? Possibly a hyena, I would think. It's probably a hyena coming. The hyenas will have heard the commotion, and hyenas often follow dogs around looking for scraps. So we'll keep an eye out for a hyena. Can hear quite a few upset birds in the distance. Uh, I don't see what's upset them yet. Not sure what happened to our leopard. I can still see the other vehicle in the background, so I think they've still got him over there. We'll head over there in a little bit. I'm still intrigued to see what's bothered these birds. Something. Uh, you could see the, the the dogs were looking at something in that direction as well, but I wouldn't be surprised to see a hyena wander into the fray. You can hear that. Ah, possibly it's a it's a raptor. We've got a. Oh, it looks like an African hawk eagle just flew past. That's what you can probably hear the Franklins calling. That's what harassed them. All happening. African hawk eagle. Sorry, we couldn't show you that one, but it just did a big flyby of the car. But that's what upset the birds. Wow, what an incredible 15, 20 minutes of action. Uh, it seems like our leopards disappeared into the block. You know what um, Wawati is like. It sounds like he may have ducked into the thick stuff, but we will go and have a look for him because I know he's a lot more relaxed after dark and it is beginning to get a little darker here. So we'll stick with the dogs for a bit longer and then we'll go and see if we can find Bulawati. But from all the crazy predator action here on Quarantine, let's send you across to Tristan and his lions. Well, we're just following the lions down the road. They're about to cross into Buffel's Hook. Um, so they've just kind of gone straight down the road itself. Sorry, Paul. Um, and Paul's struggling with the cars that are kind of driving next to them. but. Weirdly, S8's the one in the lead. He's just walking as though he's going to dictate where they're going and they are kind of all following in behind him. Sorry, there's just a little cub that's coming out in front here. So I don't want to drive too close to that. Let that little cub catch up. But you can see they're all kind of walking in S8 right in the front, walking along. I wanted to try and get in front of them so we could get the whole pride walking past us, but it's really tricky with all the vehicles to do so. Um, I'm going to try now that the cubs have kind of caught up a little bit and we'll try to just quickly shoot past everybody and then hopefully we can get S8 and the Pride all coming past us. Um, although it looks like they, he's cutting off into um, Torchwood. So maybe that's going to trigger the rest to go as well, unfortunately. Um, but he's just sniffing around. The buffalo are all around this area, so it could just be to do with that. But what an insane afternoon. Leopard, wild dogs, lions. Juma is heaving and I'm sure there'll be a hyena too. Um, I also found tracks for Tlalamba. She came back from Buffles Hook and she went past Buffles Hook Dam and she cut into Torchwood um, on her normal route. So um, unfortunately she's crossed out but she's around and then I heard now I just got an update that there's another leopard on Gari Main somewhere but I don't know where. 
um, I haven't wasn't able to hear nicely. I was busy trying to sort out things. Look, look at the Cubs playing with. They all. Oh, this is so cool. <laughs> S8 and Cubs and moms and everybody together, all greeting one another. These little Cubs, unfortunately, in the road was not what we wanted. But you can see they all just came and greeted him while he was lying down there. I was hoping they were all just going to go there for a little bit and then we could have gotten past everybody but I'm just going to try while they just milling about and then we can get them walking past us I'm sure he's going to roar now now it's the right time of day hopefully he does it before he crosses the cut line um, the cut line is right here so I'm worried that they're going to cross out Nothing like driving with lions walking next to you. Just smells like buffalo everywhere here. Let's go give it a little bit of room so that I can turn and they're not right on top of us by the time I turn. Um, and then we'll give them a chance to, to come around. But you can see the buffalo dung and buffalo everything all around here. This is from when they came in this morning. So they might roll around a little bit now on the dung and take a bit of time to get to us. But like I say, I just wanted to have a bit of a chance to get to where we needed to be in order for Mpoh to get a decent walk by. And what I'm actually going to do is just, Mpoh, I'm going to try and turn you so that that pole is out of the way. How's that? Is that all right? Whew. It was a fair amount of maneuvering. But yeah, we should get them all coming straight towards us, which will be really nice. Amazing how silent they are when approaching. You see how everyone greets each other when they find one on the road. And you will see some lights every now and then. Unfortunately, the reality is is that there are other cars in sighting. How cool is this though? I love how the cubs love cuddling with a big male lion. Shima. You mean you say you love how the cubs love cuddling with the big male lions? I know it's cool, isn't it? When the cubs do it. Um, they're always intrigued by big male lions. How awesome is that? Exactly what we wanted. Now there's still one more female to come um, and then the cut line is right behind me here so I was just like pulling off quickly to get them um, but yeah they're going to turn so let me just turn you quickly and pull. But there we go there. look at the cubs all around S8 he's like no back up everybody move I'm trying to get through <laughs> but a growling off you guys. Amazing, eh? But yeah, unfortunately, that's going to be that. We're going to have to leave them there and let them go. Um, the cars are going to go past, and like I say, that's the boundary right there. So they about 10 meters from crossing into Piffles Hook, which we expected. There's one line next to me here that will come past us. Um, you can see her just walking past now. Hello, girl. She's the one with the sore foot. You can see her back right foot, how she lifts it. It's got a bit of damage. Undoubtedly, another buffalo incident or a bite from another lion at some point. One of the two would be my guess. Anyway, that's that. I'm afraid, guys, we're going to leave them there. Um, let them carry on. Uh, we spent quite a vast majority of our afternoon with them, so it was really good. 
Cindy, do you say wow, just wow? Cool, eh? Um, like I say, it's always amazing when you get these walk-bys by lions and you get the whole pride filing past you. Um, it's a very, very special thing to see. So I agree, it is a wow thing. I was just looking at S8's tracks here. Funny enough, for such a big boy, he actually doesn't have the largest of feet. I've seen the Birmingham's feet were much bigger and the Mopojo's feet were much bigger. Um, and the Matimbas, the Matimbas also had really big feet. But um, these, this boy is not massive, massive compared to some others. Anyway, let's carry on. Let's go see what else we can find. You never know, maybe we're lucky. Seems like it's one of those afternoons where a lot is going on. Oh, these dogs are still having a well of a time up here on quarantine. There's a few arguments uh, going on over the last scraps of that poor little impala lamb. Uh, there's a leg sort of being passed between everybody. But what an incredible hour, well, a few hours it's been, but particularly the last half an hour, 45 minutes or so. Very strange favour. The pups seem to be getting harassed by the adults, which is a little unusual. You see that submissive posture that they're adapting, adopting, by exposing their bellies. Maybe they ate too much food and they're getting <laughs> a bit of a slap on the wrists. <laughs> Shame. I wonder if it's because they have eaten and then the adults are trying to sort of, you know, but that's the, normally the behaviour that they would do that would cause uh, other dogs to regurgitate that food and maybe the pups haven't learned that skill properly yet I'm not quite sure what's going on there's no malice in what we're seeing it's just all play or play in inverted commas learning curve let's call it that but this will be the last segment we are losing light as you can see we are in IR now uh, and we don't stay with the dogs even with the IR light after dark uh, just because of the fragile nature of their numbers and we don't want to do anything to upset them or give their sort of position away to other predators more than anything else so we will be leaving them after this but what an incredible 
hour or so it's been. It's all chasing each other around. And then we're going to go and see if we can't find Mulawati again. I still can't believe that, watching dogs play around up here with a leopard in the background. It was insane. Oh, I should also mention, so I got so distracted, we did get a correct answer from our uh, last quiz as well. So let me just give you the, uh, the details of that one. Um, so the winner was Deborah D, who quite correctly said that spiders basically have three main methods of hunting, webs, trap-like holes, and ambush hunters. Those are the three main categories that spiders will use. But of course there are other sort of weird ones like the bolus spider that uh, swings like a, a lasso at its prey with sticky silk globule on the end. Um, you get the spitting spiders which actually do spit, a bit like Spider-Man, they, they spit out uh, silk, sticky silk laced with neurotoxic venom. Uh, so there are all sorts of other ways but those are the three main hunting methods. So very well done. Um, yes, very well done Deborah D. And thanks everybody else for your answers. I'm just going to move the car slightly because these dogs have sort of gone a little bit behind us now. So I'm just going to move forward. Okay, let's give you a slightly better view. see them in an open area like this. I can still hear the occasional crunching of bones. Uh, a small thing like that impala lamb, uh, then they will pretty much be finishing absolutely all of it. Uh, those bones are not yet sort of fully formed and are still relatively soft and even though dogs don't have a massive bite force compared to lion or hyena, I actually don't know what their bite force is, but uh, just looking at the structure of their skull, I would think not anywhere close to the others more than enough to crunch open those bones and get that nutritious marrow. Uh, speaking of predators and quizzes though, let's give you our fourth and final hunt-based quiz for this afternoon. So same rules apply, send your name and your email address and answer through to us and we will pick a winner. So question number four is, what conditions do predators need to be aware of when hunting? So this is quite a big one. So there are obviously more than one. So what conditions do predators need to be aware of when hunting? So send in your ideas and we'd like to see as many as possible because of course there are quite a few variables that need to be considered. So send in your answers and we will give you the answer in the next, well, before the end of the show. What is the time? Mm, it's getting late. But yes, do send in your answers and we're going to enjoy these last few minutes with these dogs before the light completely fails us. I think the time has come. We've lost sufficient light now, and so the last thing we want to do is put any undue stress or danger on these dogs. We have had an absolutely spectacular last hour or so with them. Uh, so we're going to leave them in peace for a little bit, still up here on quarantine. Maybe we have some luck finding them again tomorrow. Uh, and then, um, but for now, we'll send you back to Tristan, who is on a bit of a nocturnal bumble. Let's see if he's found anything. Well, I'm sure it's been incredible. Following dogs is always fun and then bumping into a leopard. I, dogs and leopards, it's always on the cards. Um, I don't know what it is, but I think the commotion and the kill and the excitement and the noise, leopards know what's going on and so they typically are never far away. What is really, really interesting is 
Um, I finally managed to get hold of somebody and find out about that update uh, um, about the leopard on Gauri Main. I don't know, I know it's IR, so I'm not sure this is going to work, but let's try. Um, I don't know if these will come out nicely. But where Ben is, is basically here on a little spot called Philemon's Dip. So this is quarantine up top here, and it comes down, and it's very, very close to there is where he is with Mulawati. Now, Tortoise Pan was seen here um, on Gari Main. So you can see that distance there is very, very close to one another. Um, unfortunately, he has gone south into Lilgari. The guys were running the sighting on the Eastern Channel, even though he was inside Juma. Um, and yeah, so we didn't get an update until now, but he's gone into Lilgari, unfortunately. Otherwise, I would have gone there quickly. Um, but that's okay. We had a really nice sighting with the lions, and it is what it is. Um, we uh, managed to miss him. But what I wanted to say is that this is a very, very fine line for two male leopards. Um, and if one of them, I think, had soared, we would have found them coming together and there would have been some semblance of interaction. Um, to give you an idea, to drive from there to there, if you come down this and then down Shabama Road, is probably about a seven, eight minute drive. So if a leopard just comes straight through the block like this at speed, if it's wanting to get to another leopard, it could do it within, I don't know, five minutes, six minutes, if it wanted to really get there. Um, so they're that close together. Um, and it would be quite interesting to see what would happen if the two of them met up. We haven't had a male leopard sort of spat in a while. I mean, I know there was Ngoboswan and um, Mulamati recently that kind of had a little bit of a interaction, but there hasn't been much else. And there was, it's bound to happen at some point because this western side, which is where, so to give you an idea, Tortoise Pan comes in here, Vuetel Access, and it should be done during the day, guys. And so I'll probably do this at some point again. But he comes in here. And he comes down where it's access, and then generally he takes Zoe's road, and he comes all the way down, then down towards Shibamu, and then out. So that's Tortoise Pan. Tavungumi comes in from the gate, and he comes down on where access, so they both mark on that road. And then he cuts through like this, down as far as Galago Pan, and then up, and into back into Buffalo's Hook, and then obviously Mulawati. Well, we've seen him as far as Zoe's Road at the bottom here, coming all the way up Zoe's Road, um, up towards Aubrey's Road, and then round this side. So you can see all three of them actually move on this little section. And so at some point, there's going to be an interaction between these boys, I would imagine. And it's going to obviously be something that they end up, probably a female will cause the, the issue, um, or a kill, one of the two. Anyway, let's carry on. I don't know what we're looking for right now. We're just bumbling at this stage. It's been such a bumper afternoon on Juma. I don't think we really, between Ben and I, can add too much more. I suppose there's always something. You know, it's nighttime, so I'm sure a lot of you would say pangolin or aardvark or caracal or serval or porcupine. So you never know. I mean, maybe one of those comes out. It's overcast, cool weather. And so things like aardvarks, and pangolins come out earlier in weather like this. Um, but yeah, it's, chances are with this thick bush is very, 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 very tricky. You're gonna have to hope that said animal is on the road. And even then, if it's something like an aardvark, you're probably not gonna get it on camera unless we live at the time. Um, pangolins are a little bit different. They're a little bit slower moving, so you can often get them, but um, they're not exactly that common either, let's be honest. So, I don't, have we actually ever put a pangolin on camera? I don't think so, on Juma itself. I mean, we've had on Buffalo's Hook, we've had on Cheetah Plains, uh, but I don't think on Juma itself, which is quite interesting. All right, off we go. Let's go see what else is lurking and what's around, and maybe we can pull some rabbit out the hat as we bumble slowly back towards the center part of Juma. Been a relatively quiet afternoon here at Pridelands, I must say. You know, we, we had a herd of elephants briefly, but they were so quick over the road that um, we couldn't. <laughs> we literally just saw them and they moved into the bush. It's like all of them are. I don't know if the weather has got something to do with it, but other than that, just the usual, you know, impala. Every now and then, even in Paulus, I must say, I was just talking to to Panda just now. I said, you know, we even not seen a lot of Impala this afternoon. 
All right, so how are we gonna try and circumnavigate that? Okay, it's dark now. Potentially predators on the move. Perhaps we might find the leopard, you never know. Oh, it's making chichi up here. Anyway, um, so now I'm just driving slowly. I'm, I'm on Glorview South. And literally in first gear, checking every bush, hoping to perhaps spot the genet or perhaps a civet, an owl, or anything nocturnal. Obviously, if we're very lucky, we might even see a leopard, you never know. The key is to drive slowly. Check every little gap with the light. Just wanted to change hands every now and then because... <laughs> does get tired eventually. I don't know, hopefully it will pay off, you never know. Right, I'm gonna keep doing it and see if it's gonna pay off or not. Quick as well, so that we can get signal, or better signal, as soon as we get up this other side here. Should be. Bigger. We're out. Um, so, yeah, we just came down, nothing really to report. I saw one little grass frog popping over the road and into the bush. Maybe once they go into the grass, you've got no chance. Um, so that was a bad All right, so it sounds like unfortunately our signal is not helping with where we are. I was hoping just maybe, just maybe, that we would be able to somehow get something um, and kind of pull something from its sort of signal. Um, but in the meantime, though, let's send you across to Ben, who's on a bumble. Okay, so we've left the dogs on quarantine. I'm now having a look to see if we can have any luck relocating on Mulwati, who was also watching the dogs with us. Pretty much where you see in front of us is where he disappeared into the bushes, apparently. Just going to double check here now we've got the spotlight in case we see some eye shine. Otherwise, I'm going to go around to Philemon's dip and loop through Rebecca's. Maybe he's popped out that side, but as we know, he is not the most accommodating of cats. However, when I've had sightings of him at night time he's been a lot more relaxed with the vehicles and obviously we don't want to upset him at all so we'll leave it up to him if we do find him whether or not we can view him at all but that's not unusual for leopards i've worked with leopards like that before during the daytime they're very skittish they don't like to be seen they'll just sort of vacate the area and disappear into the thick stuff but at night time they're far more relaxed because they feel more confident as an individual as it were they know that that is there uh, that's when they do their best work and they seem to just gain a lot more confidence same with lions as well for that matter you bump into a lion on foot during the day or a leopard on foot during the day and chances are you'll be absolutely fine as long as you don't run remember that's rule number one because predators chase things uh, but at night time oh yeah i'll be a lot more careful they are far more confident we have to turn around and go and try Philemon's dip. That was the general area that the other vehicle that did see him briefly said that he went into. I just wanted to make sure he hadn't just flopped down into the grass and the tree line there, but no sign. But what an incredible afternoon it's been, and maybe we can top it off with some spots.
He does have big feet though, Mulawati. When I saw his tracks, again, everything looks a little bit bigger. Even when I saw those dog tracks, we sort of had to double take them and make sure it wasn't hyena, because don't forget we had a lot of rain this morning. So the tracks have sort of all expanded when these animals have put pressure into the, the soft sand and into the mud. And it has a tendency to make the tracks look bigger than they would normally be. I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't go too far from here. If the dog's around, he knows there might be some scraps. I also saw what I think was a white-tailed mongoose. I had to take a, a little bit of a, a break after those dogs. And whilst I was out of the vehicle, I could see something moving around on the road and just shine the light down there briefly. And what looked like a white-tailed mongoose skipped across the road. But I know we do have a, a relaxed one or two uh, that do hang around here on quarantine. Okay, but while we take a good look around to see if Mulawati pops his head out somewhere, what's it? Oh, no, that's an impala. Uh, let's send you back over to Lisa on the dam cam and see what she's got. Thank you, Ben, and best of luck to yourself and Tristan on your night bumble. Hopefully you find something interesting. Not that I think <laughs> you need it. We've had such a brilliant afternoon already, but of course, you know, we can never be thankful enough for all of these amazing creatures we see. And our black rhino is still sticking around here in Okokoyo, as well as a giraffe on the other side of the water hole. And again, this black rhino is... He's uh, behaving very strangely, but uh, my apologies. I'm going to send you back to Chris, who's got a small cat. Just as I said, Brightlands is a little quiet this afternoon. Just now, saw the eyes and I told Banda, listen, that looks like a small cat. And there we go, an African wildcat. How about that? <laughs> this is my first African wildcat at Brightlands. And doesn't that just look like a house cat? And the reason for that is this is, in fact, the progenitor of house cats. House cats were bred from. African wildcats from what we understand very likely by the ancient Egyptians and therein lies the problem with us in the fact that African wildcats can hybridize with domestic cats so especially in farmlands and so forth close to settlements where people's house cats can become feral they fully interbreed with the african wildcats and they pollute the natural gene pool of the naturally occurring wildcats that we find out here which means closer to those areas you're unlikely to find pure african wildcats they'll be i won't say hybrids because they're essentially the same thing even though taxonomy listed as two distinct species, the house cat was virtually bred from the African wildcat. Much like dogs originated from wolves. And that is a term that we refer to as its progenitor. Oh, this is a magnificent find. It's not often we see wild cats out here. Just look at how those ears are constantly working, trying to pick up movement of anything they can eat. Ah, 
Hi there, Tim. Tim says this is an awesome find, and it's also a first for Tim. Now, it's a bit to be can't see its true colors. We're in IR, obviously. But you, if you see them in daytime, they, they've got this sort of gray complexion to them. It's almost like a, you know, like a typical ginger cat, but gray. And the reason why those typical ginger cats have those markings is, again, because it's genes that they inherited through the ages that originated from the African wildcat. And they've got this sort of rufous, rusty color behind the ears. And then the hind parts, the bottom back parts of their legs are black. But other than that, they've got the same markings on the face as house cats. I mean, they're, they're almost identical. And again, the reason being house cats were bred from these guys. It just looks like my cat at home. like for it to move. I'm not going to prompt it to move. I'm going to leave it as it is, but it would be amazing if we can see it move. And then you can see the full body. Hello there, Hannah. Um, the question of African wildcats closely related to caracals. Um, Hannah, yes. Um, well, firstly, they are cats, so they are in the same family of predators. So the predators is an, is an order, the carnivora, and then the family is the next division. They are in the family Felidae, which is all the cats. But as a lineage, in terms of genetic relationships they are in fact in the same genus Felis. Some newer taxonomic findings have placed caracals in their own genus but for a long while they were placed in the same genus Felis. Um, Felis caracal or the caracal itself and then Bit of a debate whether this is Felis sylvestris, subspecies Africanus. But anyway, and then the house cat Felis cotus. So the genus is almost like a surname, if you can look at it that way. It shows genetic relationship. This is phenomenal. My first, well, this is in fact, I think, my first wildcat since I've been involved on this show. Yeah. Panda says it's his first as well. Well, I certainly hope he gets a mouse tonight. Or she, I don't know. Just working those ears. Just working those ears. All right. You know, it looks like the cats are suddenly coming out. Kevin has a cat for us in Majikwe. Let's go and find out.
has certainly been a carnivore jamboree on wild earth this afternoon on your sunset safari. And we're continuing on that tone with the blonde one, big male lion, and he's actually feeding on a warthog carcass that he must have caught earlier on today. Actually, hear the crunching. It's not always easy to watch. But it is the way that nature unfolds, unfortunately. So for any sensitive viewers, bear with us. I don't know what he's got there. There is another vehicle joining us. See a lot of licking going on. That tongue is very, very rough. So as he licks, He's actually stripping off small portions of meat as well. See there? That tongue is like sandpaper. Looked like a fully grown male warthog. We are hoping that he gets thirsty after this feed and that we'll have to start moving towards water. The America River is about a kilometer from here. That will probably be his closest water source. Wild cats, wild dogs, leopard. We had a, early on, we had a very brief visual of a caracal. I think that you guys just missed out on. Wayne, we are so glad that you are enjoying it. It has been an action-packed cat day indeed. When you guys are welcome to use the spotlight if you want. Let's 
head over back to Tristan, who's found us some more nocturnal animals. Well, we've got a chameleon that is sitting here. Something also just walked past us. Oh, it's the whole pack of dogs that's just come running past us. <laughs> that's what that is. I just heard noise on the ground behind me and I wasn't paying attention at all, but the whole bunch of dogs have just come out. Obviously, we don't spotlight them, so we'll just leave them be. Um, but nice to have a little chameleon. Uh, it's uh, sitting on its branch doing chameleon things, which is... Not very much. We, as we know, chameleons are not excessively active in the evening. But always fun to see them. I always think of Trish when I see a chameleon and her complete obsession with them. She is by far and away the most obsessed with chameleons of anyone that I've ever known. Um, she loves a chameleon. So I um, always think of her and I'm sure she'd be very excited if she was here. Now, of course, these flat neck chameleons are are quite special creatures. It's the only chameleon species that we get in this part of the world, unfortunately. Um, the rest of South Africa, or particularly the, the Cape and um, that area, this, even into the Karoo, there's a lot more species down that side. Um, and then if you go to somewhere like Madagascar, well, then you're just spoiled for choice. There's chameleons everywhere. Um, but we only have these guys, um, and they typically are quite easy to find. Um, in the summer months if it's a warm evening um, when it gets a little bit cooler it can be a bit trickier and obviously in winter they estivate so you don't see much of them at that stage um, but they are obviously coming out at this time of the night because there's far less predation that can take place um, when a chameleon is out like this during the day then there's a number of predators that would come after it so you can imagine birds of prey you can imagine snakes you can imagine um, even something as innocuous as a as a leopard could potentially grab one of these. So for them during the day, it's all about camouflage and hiding out. And then at night, they can come out into the fringes and then expose themselves a little bit more to acquire food items. So it's a pretty cool thing to do. Now, kind of talking about cool things, it's um, obviously that time where we need to tell you who won the last of the four quizzes for this afternoon. Um, so I believe Shreyas, you are the winner. Congratulations, well done. Um, it's uh, always nice when we have somebody that wins, and especially Shreyas, who helps us out so much with identifications a lot of the time. Um, so Shreyas was saying, wind direction, presence of any spo species to spoil the hunt and camouflage, which is pretty typical. Um, it's uh, how things go. Um, predators obviously have a number of factors that basically contribute to how they go about their business. Um, and so most of the, well, all of that is correct. Um, predators are, are something that need to assess whether conditions, prey species, prey density, um, available terrain, uh, all of those things will, will dictate how they go about things. And you know, if we talk about something like chameleons, that's exactly what we just said is that they've got to try and figure out ways to combat um, being eaten versus eating themselves. And so, you know, their way of going about preying upon insects and those kinds of things, and we must also remember a lot more insects out and about um, in the evenings that are flying around, um, is to come out at night and therefore not to expose themselves as much to predators. Um, they can then um, kind of hide away during the day and then at night come out and, and effectively try and find food. It's not to say that they won't feed during the day. If they're sitting in their little tree um, and camouflaging and something comes right past them, they'll obviously take it. And it's not like they're not going to eat, but they try not to draw as much attention to themselves. All right, we shall leave said chameleon to itself. Let it hang out. Um, obviously, you said I don't want to stick around too much with the dogs here running past. Well, they're not running past, they're just walking past. Um, and we'll carry on and see what else is lurking. At Wild Earth, we believe that people will see animal rights as worthy by recognizing that they have emotions like us. 
In support of Animal Rights Day, we are hosting Quiz Mania. Teams will pit against each other in two days of interactive fun on the Sunset Show. How cool is this? To enter, form a team of two or more people, fill out the form on our website, and name your team. See you there. Cat species number two. <laughs> All right, like one does. I don't know who this is. I've got a feeling it's either Pixie Pan, the Pixie Pan female, or perhaps, whom I mentioned yesterday, we had a brief visual. It was actually just south of here. And I know that's an animal we see that are not calm with the cars in daytime, but at night, 100% calm. But I can't see. With what I can see here, yeah, there we go. That might give us a hint. It is a long shot. I know it's a very long shot. Let's see what. Oh, it's a bit too far. Two on the right. This is not the Marilla female. Sexy one, perhaps. Not entirely sure. I'm just going to quickly tell Craig that he can approach. Because he's inbound. Uh, Craig, you can just keep coming uh, towards the pin. Uh, I'm on lock with the animal at the moment. Um, you won't see my lights because I'm on IR. Right. <laughs> Lisa M, absolutely. You know, it was a very quiet afternoon here at Brightlands. But we ended it with a bang. We ended it with an absolute bang. And what a delightful way to end the safari. Fantastic way to end the safari.
Yeah, I'd love to know if anybody can help us to ID this animal. I mean, I'm, I'm very limited as to what I can see. Just as I thought, James Richard, thank you so much, says it's sexy one, or as we call her now, the Marula female, which was my thought as well. James, thank you so much. So, so this is one of the daughters of the Pixie Pan female, one of her previous daughters. So we did see the spot pattern on the right side. He's got two spots. You can't see the one on the left. Well, from our perspective, it will be one and two. And it looks like the belly is rather full. And I wonder if it's not her that I saw yesterday. When we had that fleeting glimpse, it was literally about 200 meters from here. So, I mean, area wise, makes sense. I just find it interesting that she's up in a Nobthorn tree. It's not a tree that they often sleep in. It's. I mean, they often use things like marula and so forth. And she's quite high up as well, which is interesting. Whoa, what a way. What a way to end the day. Did some hard yards this afternoon. And we found that African wildcat and now top it up with this sleepy leopard. Well, it's almost time for us to go to sleep as well. It was such a privilege to host you on this live safari today. And if today was anything to gauge by, tomorrow hopefully will be even better. So it's imperative that you join us tomorrow morning early. Myself and Panda will be ready to join us for yet another live safari into the African wilderness. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs>